do all of our introductions and acknowledgements at the very beginning of the conference, we decided to sort of spread them out uh, a little bit. So at this point, um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our benefactor, so to speak, our benefactor in chief, um, Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of Mr. Irvine's Law School, who has really done so much to help us make this event possible. Erwin? Thank you so much. It's wonderful for me to have the chance to welcome you. I know that you're here to listen to the panel. I know that no one comes to a conference to listen to the Dean's welcome, so I promise to be very brief. I think we have a chance to create a very special law school here at the University of California at Irvine. And this conference is so integral to what we want to be, bringing people together from around the country, from a number of different disciplines, to really look at cutting edge work. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the two people who were most responsible for this, Chris Tomlins and Catherine Just This is an amazing conference. I'm so grateful to you and the Apple Law School for planning it. Also, an enormous amount of logistical work goes into a conference like this. So I also want to thank Mary Germain and Lori Burke from our staff for all the planning they did and all of their hard work. Now, one tribute to the success of this conference is its size. We don't yet have a room within the law school large enough to hold a group of this size. But I hope that tomorrow afternoon at the end of the conference, you'll come to the reception. We're going to give you a tour of our existing facilities. And there's a lot more construction going on. We show the big. Most of all, I have a chance personally to give you a tour of the library and show you the law school that we're building. Oh, there's others who are involved here on campus. One of the things that is distinct about our law school is our close relationships with many of the schools and units on campus. We want to be interdisciplinary from the very beginning. And so what I want to do is now turn this over to another co-sponsor of the conference, Professor Mon Lynch. She's the director of the Center on Law, Society, and Culture, professor of the School of Social Ecology. It would be wonderful if you wanted to do a welcome. Okay, thank you. Everybody. I, I too am thrilled about the law school here and uh, about this conference. It's really amazing. I know um, Chris and, and it was uh, working his butt off getting this to happen, but it's really an amazing group of people that he brought together. And from the other side of campus, the non law school side of campus, we are just in heaven with the scholars that have come here, both um, as now our permanent faculty and then the people that they are bringing in. Uh, to share with the campus. So it's really a wonderful time at UCI for interdisciplinary law and society scholarship. Um, we feel very strongly about forging in these interdisciplinary bonds and um, our center, the Center in Law, Society, and Culture is truly an interdisciplinary endeavor. We have members from every unit on campus who are either faculty affiliates or on our board and who come to our events and participate. So when we heard about this conference being planned last year, Catherine shared, shared it with us. We were, we thought, oh, we've got to get on board with that. Can we you know, play a part? Can we at least you know, be, be involved in it? So we're really excited about doing that. And um, thanks so much for all of you for participating and um, for being here. Thanks. Uh, I should just add, uh, Mona didn't, but I should add that the, the Center in Law, Society, and Culture made uh, a really important material contribution because the Center helped us uh, fund the, uh, the attendance of a number of graduate students who probably could not otherwise have been here. Uh, we also had graduate student assistance from the uh, University of California's uh, Humanities Research Institute. And so I especially want to thank David Theo Goldberg, the Institute's director, for that support. David would like to have been here. He is somewhere in Europe at the moment, and so could not be. But uh, we owe both the Center and the Humanities Research Institute uh, many thanks for their support. And now, over to Ariel.
Hi, everybody. I want to, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel on law, history, and culture. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce the speakers to you briefly. I'm sure many of you know uh, all of them or know them by their work, through their work. Um, Peter Goodrich is Professor of Law and Director of Law and Humanities at Cardozo School of Law. He was the founding dean of the Department of Law at Birkbeck College, the University of London. He was also the Corporation of London Professor of Law. Um, Professor Goodrich is an expert on law, love, and friendship. He's written extensively in uh, the areas of law and literature, legal history and theory. Uh, his most recent book is Laws of Love, A Brief Historical and Practical Manual. Uh, Shia Levy is a, a director of the Minerva Center of Human Rights and teaches law at Tel Aviv Faculty of Law. Um, his uh, book, The Modern Art of Dying, A History of Euthanasia in the United States, uh, won the 2006 Distinguished Book Award in Sociology of Law from the American Sociology Association. Um, he's also visited at Toronto University, at Berkeley, um, at Humboldt University in Berlin, and he's currently working on the history of Jews and Muslims in Germany, focusing on the debate on animal slaughter rituals. Um, I wonder if I should be telling you their titles, but maybe they will. Um, Asaf Lukowski, also from Tel Aviv University, is visiting this year at the UCLA School of Law. Um, he has published on um, legal history, taxation, comparative law, and sociology of law. Um, his book, Law and Identity and Mandate Palestine, uh, was a co-winner of the 2006 Shapiro Book Award for the best book in Israel studies. Um, he has directed the Segla Center for Interdisciplinary Research at Tel Aviv University, and he edited the uh, journal Theoretical Inquiries in Law for several years. Um, Roger Berkowitz, um, at the end of the panel, uh, is Assistant Professor of Political Studies and Human Rights at Bard College. Um, he is uh, not a JD as well as a PhD uh, from UC Berkeley. Um, he's written a number uh, of books, most recently, The Gift of Science, Lightness in the Modern Legal Tradition, an account of how the rise of science has led to the divorce of law and justice in 2005. Uh, he edited a special issue of Law, Culture, and Humanities entitled Revenge and Justice. Um, and uh, as you can tell, you can tell from this paper, is interested in Nietzsche and Heidegger and a number of uh, philosophers of uh, science and justice. Um, so they will each uh, speak to us about their papers for 25 minutes, and um, then we'll, we'll have our short break and come back and discuss the papers. Okay. Okay. Uh, very exciting. Um, well, first off, every event has some species of trope or figure or theme, and for me, it's undoubtedly Chris Tomlin's performing the noble enactment of the paper of someone who wasn't here, as if they were here. <laughs> and <coughs> I would uh, say that I'm not going to read my paper, but if I were, I would undoubtedly pass the job over to Chris Tomlin to <laughs> spare you the horrors of an English accent and um, the uh, slowness with which we swallow our consonants. But I'm going to, because I believe there's a certain figure or image that's important to perform my paper orally. Having said that, of course, it would be much better if Chris Tomlin performed it orally, but we cannot ask him to do that. Picking up on the previous panel, there was much talk of speech acts, and one of the reasons that I think it's important to talk, and I'll wander at various points, is precisely because there is an element of performativity. And speech acting never forget 
is speech acting as well as speech act. And it's in that theatricality, in the acting out, that we can come to get a little bit of a sense of the problematic that I want to talk about today, which is why the history of the legal spectacle has never been written. Now, I've been working in visual advocacy. We're surrounded by the visual, the virtual, the imagistic. And I want to talk mainly about why this is a history of the image of law, the visual representation of law, has never been written. And to try and suggest through a number of examples that it has a growing significance and importance. And although this is merely history, although this is simply a reflection upon the past and in good Harvard style, uh, because I'm interested in it, it's nonetheless the case that uh, I think it has a significant and growing purchase, and I will pretend to a little bit of relevance, both strategic and tactical. So I'm going to make three points. Students at uh, Cardoza Law School, Yeshiva <laughs> University, they often say this, this obsession with three points is playing for the wrong team, but it's simply the polytheism of monotheism that I, I want to draw your attention to. And I want to, to look to and reflect upon how it is that law manipulates and uses the image. Under one reigning rubric, if I might, a little bit of Latin, there's a Baroque maxim that seems to me important today, increasingly so, and that has been written about with incredible philological erudition by Giorgio Agamben, and his work lies very much at the back. His recent work, um, which I mistranslate as power and the glory, that's just because I, I grew up with an Anglican priest as my father, I think the proper translation, the Regne et la gloire, the kingdom and glory, that misses out the, the interlinking. So the, the maxim is rex regnat sed non gubernat, and I think that's been coming up time and time again today. The sovereign rules, but the sovereign doesn't govern. There's an ellipse, there's a gap, there's an antinomic relationship between the two. And within that antinomic dependency, I would place the image, the angelogical, the hymnological, the acclamatory, that allows that antinomic dependence, that passage that is also resistance. So three points, because of course there always have to be. So my first point is just that, that lawyers and my therapist keeps reminding me, don't insult your audience, and a lot of you will be lawyers, but lawyers are perhaps not the most visual of creatures, and there are interesting surveys of congenital eye deficiency in different professions and lawyers <laughs> always come out first as having been born short-sighted generally it's myopia and having formed their personalities prior to receiving corrective spectacles <laughs> so their world is built around rules that uh, do not require actually seeing what you're dealing with so there is a resistance there is a sense in which the legal profession and i'll, I'll talk to this uh, for a bit uh, has a, a fear and a, an antinomic dependency, a, a hostility as well as a dependence upon images, and I'd suggest that that dependency is at the level of, of structure. And it should be understood in terms of the classic figure of dissimulation, that they're necessary, but they should not be, or their dependency should not be too evident. So my next point is, and this is just in case I, I forget, or I get distracted, or Ariella stops me, as she undoubtedly will. So uh, my next point will be that there is a reason for that legal hostility, and that reason is embedded deep in common law, and is jurisdictional. In other words, the reason that lawyers don't deal with images is, is not that they can't see the legal spectacle because they need spectacles, it's simply, that's an English joke, because you, you talk about glasses. Um, we, we talk about spectacles, you know, that's how you correct. Um, but uh, the reason is that the economy, or the iconocratic, the visual, was always part of the ecclesiastical jurisdiction that was annexed to common law. So that, that there is a sense in which 
lawyers never had the training, lawyers are only currently having to learn and tool and equip, and uh, that is by virtue of a jurisdiction that was annexed but never in any methodical sense in incorporated or internalized. And then the last point, final marker, would be that along with this jurisdictional incapacity or inability, there's a really deep dependency upon the image for the promulgation and the uh, dissemination of law. There's a sense in which the, the image is, is everywhere, the spectacular is everywhere, far more so than the word. And that uh, spectacularity of law, homo spectabilis or super illustrious or whatever the books, there is a history of the legal use of images, the jus imaginum. But what's really surprising to modern eyes in relation to that is that the legal use of images is all to do with the order of precedence and the modes of eminence and honor. To be seen is to be <coughs> ennobled, is to be aggrandized, is to form part of a hierarchy, a hierarchy quite explicitly modeled upon the angiological hierarchy, upon a hymnological choral and a clamatory mode, which we find in the Inns of Court and we find elsewhere. So let me start, if I So, lawyers and the visual. Let me start with the case, because we, we like cases. When Dan Brown was sued for copyright infringement in relation to his book, The Da Vinci Code, in the English Court of Chancery, the dispute was not in any substantive sense a significant one, although it was in many respects highly amusing in its content. But that's just a little typographical feature to the eventual judgment that was completely missed by those to whom it was handed down. What we have here is a PDF, a, a perfume distraction fucus of the first page of the judgment. Judgment handed down had certain peculiarities. I say and I show this to my students and they, they generally don't see it, but what do they see? Take them to the law library, do they see the portraits of the deans that hang over them? Erwin, uh, beware. They overlook them as they are overlooked by them. <laughs> so, they have no idea they're there. Um, I, I perform many experiments, but here, if, if you look closely, there are a number of randomly italicized and emboldened letters in the course of the judgment. This is just the first one. So the S of claimants, the M of claimants in the second paragraph, and so we go on, C of cynicism rather nicely, just subsequently. So what are we to make of that? The judge using the Fibonacci code, which had been the subject matter of the winning novel in the dispute, had embedded a code in the judgment. And that code, when translated into the vernacular, made up the following sentence, which was, Smithy code, who are who are you, Jackie Fisher? Dreadnought. <laughs> well, let me say two things. Now, number one, this wasn't noticed. It was not really seen. It was only because the judge started emailing members of his audience that anybody realized that there was this peculiarity. Because we don't, we don't read very closely. We read the text as if we're seeing through it. We don't see it as a a visual device as itself an image. Uh, the second point is that the Court of Appeal had to mention it when the case went to appeal. And the Court of Appeal determination was very brief, but they said that it was unfortunate, basically, that the judge had embedded this code in the judgment. They said, nothing turns on it. Next sentence, one space of separation. The judgment is difficult to read and hard to understand. In other words, far from being insignificant, it had a heavily negative connotation, which I, of course, in a piece I won't talk about here, have 
proven to be precisely not the case. In other words, Dreadnought and Jackie Fisher stand in the same relation as Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. You have there what classically would be called a device with an S. You have an image of a judgment. Dreadnought was the new big gun ship which sunk everything else until Jutland and then it got sunk, but you can't account for German fog. Um, but it, it was a big hit for a while, but it had been designed not by Jackie Fisher, who was the English admiral who was accredited with it. It was actually designed by Vittorio Cuniberti sometime before, an Italian naval architect, and Jackie Fisher had taken the design. So the party that enacts, the party that performs, the party that successfully produces, the party that is the winner is the winner, is basically the logic of that decision. And I think that properly enunciates the position of Justice Smith, the author of the code, in relation to the copyright infringement case. So there are certain differences. But he really liked fiction. It has a special attractiveness. It's sphinx-like. And even at a certain point, he says, a legal judgment is not, I hope, a fiction, which is a classic oratorical definition, meaning he really hopes that it's as good as a fiction. Uh, and on and on, I could uh, take you much further. But that's the Da Vinci Code case. And it has a significance more than anything else for me in this context in that it shows us that these words are not simply words. The common law has never treated these words as simply words. There's something more going on. And it's that something more going on that I want to move towards. But just before we leave the blindness of lawyers, because I, I love finding things that other people haven't found and showing them things that they can't see, thus whetting their appetite, I hope. But here. Batami annos jurisprudentia. We're very used to seeing justitia blindfolded. We're very used as lawyers to saying, well, justice is blindfolded, but law is evident, open, and there to be seen. Anno has a picture here of justitia on a pedestal. Always justice, law is coming from above. The book is quite open. The book is a perfect sign. Sit liber judex was the relevant maxim. Let the book decide. That's the theorem. Here it is, coming from above. Often you will see stars splashing down on the text and radiance emanating out. But underneath, underneath, the lawyers and the politicians are blindfolded. It's the audience that's blindfolded. I'm sorry, this is taken, doubtless, without permission, from Gallica, from the French National Library website. And it's not of the highest quality, but uh, I assure the law review that uh, when they get hold of it, it will be in 786 pixelations. So uh, it is visible, I can assure you, when I, I look at it in its uh, miniaturized form. They're all blindfolded. So what's the point? What's the relationship of law to the image? And the answer is partly that law should look with downcast eyes. Also that lawyers should internalize. And that lawyers should learn to see, be brought to see. But the point initially for me is simply that the, the lawyers are removed from the image. The lawyers cannot see. And then, today, we don't normally see lawyers wandering around with blindfolds. They're wearing spectacles. So, we have to undo that metaphoricity. But to undo a metaphoricity, we need first to understand it, and to understand that there is a tradition that clearly depicts the lawyers as blindfolded, and justice as all seen. Let us move then just to a last point about the words of the law. If you look at the common law sources around this time, Plowden and the like, you will see that they talk about words as images. Words are images of intention. Words are the impress or vestige 
words are signs. And this, of course, comes from a long theological Christian tradition in which we see the words. That's what the sacrament is, the visible word. We do that vocans. We see the promulgation of law. We see the text. It's an image, and it refers in the manner of a relic or vestige, or as they call it, an impress or device. It's the tip of an iceberg. But truth is a mark left by an absconded or absent source. That is the Christian position. That's what you find in Cook and in others. Look at the beginning of the Institutes, and I'm sure you never have. There are a number of pictures. Two pictures in particular are important. One is the law book on a cushion with a cross in front of it, sword and arms, for God, for sovereign, for you, in Latin underneath, because the sovereign always speaks Latin. And then in Plowden and so on, we find exactly the same thing. These words are simply references in Cook, it's not the words, but the truth is to be loved. Non verbis sed veritas est demanda. It's behind, it's beyond, it's referential. So why, why have lawyers treated the book as both silent and invisible in aesthetic or visual terms? And the answer, I suggest, is tied up in this notion of the sovereign ruling but not governing. The jurisdictional issue, of course, fond to the English, less fond to the US that inherited that law, the jurisdictional issue is that in the 1530s, Henry VIII asked the two universities whether the Roman pontiff had greater power and force than any other external bishop, and the universities understandably caring for their necks, said so none whatsoever, Henry, old boy. So Henry took it all. So look at the law dictionary, the Enigmata Juris from 1506, and it has a dual definition of iconomous and oikonomous. Iconomous is the ecclesiastical jurisdiction that governs the visible realm. That is iconocracy, visiocracy, the licit order of images. Oikonomos, and we've been mentioning Janus, that's the administrative realm. And the administrative realm, where you do what you want, because you're father of the family, generally speaking, the oikonomic realm, which Gambon writes a great deal about, that forgotten realm, is the realm where things are actually done, the realm of practice, a realm that is separate from the economic. The lawyers did not, did not inherit that in the best of manners. If you look at the late 17th century texts on the two laws, ecclesiastical and civil, you find the ordinary Godolphin talking about how we simply don't understand common law if we don't understand its theological basis. It is but insignificant and disfigured ciphers if you haven't understood the question that Henry VIII asked at the universities, and so on, and so on. So <clears throat> the best that you find from the Commendam case, I didn't see what of it, five minutes, my lord, I'm only on the first point. OK, well, I'll speed up. So the Commendam case, it's one of the flores quae faciunt corona. This jurisdiction becomes part of the sovereign aura and rule. One of the flowers of the crown, and that's a fascinating word to unpack. What are the flores, the flores of rhetoric, of dictionaries, of enigmata, as Nebriha, the author of the Enigmata Juris, put. So there, there we stand, and if you want an illustration of that curious duality, there's a great case, uh, Thomas and the state of Mississippi from not long ago. Thomas was pulled up before Judge Guest, what a great name, for having failed to pay a parking suspension fine, a license suspension fine. When he was brought before the judge, the judge informed him that he was also charged with 
um, public profanity. The judge proceeded to try him for public profanity, find him guilty and fine him. On his way out of the court, Thomas said, son of a bitch. The judge had him handcuffed and brought before him and demanded to know whether or not he understood what was happening. He was in contempt of court and he refused to say anything which greatly upset Judge Guest. He then was taken to jail, he was sentenced to jail, and on his way out of the court, I'm afraid, he repeated his <laughs> profanity. <laughs> at which point the judge jumped off the bench and came down and attacked him. Had to be physically removed. So the question in the case was whether the contempt holding held. And of course, Reyes Regnat said non gubernat it held. Nothing in the behavior of the judge demitted from the contempt sentencing. The defendant's argument that his statement had been ad hominem, not directed at the judge, was thrown out. So there we have that duality that I want to then discuss just very briefly in relation to a third point, which is what does this suppressed jurisdiction actually mean? And there is a history of the jus imaginum. If you look at the early inns of court treaties, on images, heraldry, honor, colors, the visible world and realm of the law, then you find that it is entirely about an order of visible precedence that is modeled upon the angelological hierarchy. The moment that you have a hierarchy, you have politics and you have law. You have no law without hierarchy, and it is that hierarchy that gets instantiated. If you look at Richard Hooker, we are not far removed and should not believe that we are any distance from the angels. They are what give us meaning. They are what infuse us with honor and dignity and all those other flowers of living. And so too, the inns of court are houses of honor. If you look at Chasseneur, Catalogus Gloriae Mundi, law book that begins, first substantive section, with the nine gradations of the angelological. And it's that which is translated by Selden, who uses some of the same images as does Panzirolus, into the order of law and the order of the courts. So then just last example, if I'm permitted, which is a case in which the visibility of law was precisely the issue. And this is such a good question for today. Canadian minister was getting divorced. It was an unopposed divorce case. The hearing was held at lunchtime in the courthouse. And the report stipulates that the judge, without his robes, retired with a reporter to his private library. Edgar Allan Poe couldn't have done it better, yeah? So, the hearing was held through a door marked with a brass plaque and black letters, private. Then there was an inner corridor and a further set of doors, and then the judicial chamber's library, and that's where the hearing was held. The judge opened it counterintuitively by saying, we're now in open court, but of course, they weren't in open court and there was no public presence, although, as Lord Blainsborough says, the judge would probably have liked some public presence, because judging can be lonely. You like to be loved, but he wasn't. So, the question was whether the decree nisi that he promulgated on that occasion could stand. So the aptly named Privy Council gave a very lengthy set of judgments in which they said, holding hearings in public is the salt of the Constitution. What distinguishes the judicial from the merely administrative is precisely ceremony, right, and robe. It's not the same. Does a judge demit his capacity? Can a judge be a judge if it's an idle ceremony? No. It is pessimi exempli, which is just gobbledygook for the worst of examples. 
It is to be frowned upon and not to be permitted, and will never be permitted, so long as common law is common law. And then as to the decree nisi, well, nothing turns on that. That can stand. We'll uphold it. Thank you very much. In other words, no relation between the two. Okay, thank you. Okay, then you hit podium laptop and you've got a 10% chance to have a way here. Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to thank the organizers again uh, for organizing such a, a great uh, group of people. Uh, I uh, flew from far away and I, uh, from Israel, I mentioned this just to uh, point to the fact that I have a bit jet lag, so if you see me yawning during my own presentation, it's not there because it's boring. <laughs> I, um, I'd like to begin by trying to tie whatever is going to happen later with the theme of the conference, the law and and law as, and then set it aside and we can come back to it in the discussion. How might one, how, excuse me, how might one go about gaining new imaginative leverage to enliven the practice of legal history, asks the call for papers, and calls for a paradigm shift. Presumably, a new perspective is needed not simply because law and has run its course, but because it was committed from the outset to an unimaginative, realist perception of law. Presumably, law as is an attractive alternative not only for its novelty, but because it calls on us to imagine. The turn to metaphor is offered as a way to free us from the bonds of empiricism, historicism, and other scientism. The, disenchantment, the disenchanting spell of the social sciences is to be countered or complemented by a re-enchanted writing of legal history. The following study of Jewish ritual in 19th century Germany may be read in part as an attempt to think through the relationship between science, realism, and disenchantment on the one hand, and metaphor, imagination, and re-enchantment on the other hand. Not only in the writing of legal history, but in legal history itself. What seems at first as conflicting views on method and theory may turn out to be uh, dialectical, but later I'll use a different uh, uh, adjective, a dialectical movement of law itself. One may find between the li lines of the following study a Jewish parable about the law and and law as of modern legal history. So since this is a parable and you may not understand it, let me just uh, <laughs> clarify a few, uh, a few points. So basically, my argument will work on, 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 on uh, one explicit level and one implicit. Uh, on explicitly, what I want to do is challenge uh, or rethink the Weberian thesis of secularization, that is, to rethink uh, on a first order a, a, a history of uh, modernity. On a second level, implicit, is a, a question about the writing of legal history. And there, what I want to uh, ask is about, uh, again, about secularization and its other, uh, that is, uh, attempts to re-enchant not only legal history, but the writing of legal history. And uh, I wasn't planning this, but in a way, Peter's uh, paper belongs to uh, uh, this, this uh, movement uh, in the writing of legal history, which is, can be read uh, along with uh, Alan Ben's writings and uh, Benjamin's writings and writings in the political theology and other writings in legal history as attempt to re-enchant uh, the writing of legal history. So uh, I'll call this movement later uh, ritualization of uh, law. Uh, ritualization in the case study that I'm uh, writing about is ritualization of religion, sort of the invention of religion, the modern concept of religion as 
uh, ritual. And uh, alongside with this, we can ask how did, to an extent, the writing of legal history, uh, in the writing of legal history, how did law become uh, ritual, that is, uh, enchanted in the way that it has. And so I'm, I'm interested in, in this double, double movement. My field, that is what I'll be talking about, concerns uh, in the paper four different Jewish practices that were known as rituals in the late 18th century and 19th century. Uh, the ritual bath, circumcision, uh, animal slaughter, um, and the burial of the dead. In my talk today, I'll focus only about uh, ritual slaughter of uh, animals and the problems it uh, raises. Basically, the history of these rituals has been written and rewritten. There's a lot of literature about it. I think it more or less can be said to belong to the Weberian secularization uh, approach to history and legal history. But it's an attempt to show how the tension between religion and the secular state is uh, the story of these rituals, how attempts have been made to either prohibit or limit or reform the move, move these uh, religious practices, both from above and from within the religious community uh, itself. And what I'd like to do is add another account of this history, which won't tell the story of how these rituals became secularized, or how um, the uh, tension between the state and the religious practices concern uh, movements of secularization, but rather I'm interested in how the rituals became understood to be rituals, uh, how they were ritualized, and what does that exactly uh, mean, and I'll return to that point in a minute. So, um, I choose to look at Jews in Germany because Germany, uh, Weber's home country, is the place in which secularization is uh, the name of the game, is the strongest uh, and can be most observable. Uh, and the Jewish community in Germany adopted in many ways these secularized, rationalized notions of modernity. So it's, it's a place where secularization see this is most prominent, but I want to look there to find something else. Um, and it's important for me that uh, the discussion is about the Jews, though it doesn't have to be about the Jews, it could as easily be about uh, the Muslims today in uh, Germany. But the story is about how when we look at the uh, Jewish practice, thinking about it through the prism of ritual, uh, as a ritual, thinking about it through the prism of ritualization raises certain questions about uh, an, an adopting a Christian perspective on Jewish practice. But not only that, so that's uh, a point. And as for the specific examples that I'll be talking about, ritual slaughter of animals, basically the story is, and I won't t tell it here at length, the, uh, the story from the Weberian perspective is on how uh, religious practice, uh, religious uh, ritual, uh, raised certain questions for the Kulturstadt, for a modern civilized society. Uh, part of these questions concerned the fact that ritual slaughter was considered to be cruel to the animal, unnecessarily cruel. Parts of it has to concern the way that it was unhygienic, the spur of the blood, uh, and what have you. And the story is usually told as how the Jewish community uh, partly abandoned dietary laws and ritual slaughter, partly tried to reform them, partly tried to justify them in accordance with modern sensitivities, that is, argue that Jewish slaughter is in fact humane. But as you'll see, my con concern is with a different, different take on this question. I'm interested in how uh, secularization, or the secular, invented simultaneously itself and its other, that is, religion in a very specific way. Um, I, should, I should, though, uh, make two uh, preliminary comments to sort of preempt possible misunderstandings of the argument. So, first, my argument isn't about the dialectics of rationality and irrationality. That goes back to the first comment 
uh, after the previous panel. It's, it's, not about, it's not about that, neither in the history nor in the writing of legal history. That's not the juxtaposition that I'm interested in. Uh, rather, uh, we'll see that, in a way, secularization and ritualization are not contrary, but rather complementary and have, uh, and in any event, need to be understood, first of all, each on its own terms, rather than merely as uh, contrasts. The second point is that my argument, it doesn't belong so much to the post-colonial discourse of how the other is invented uh, in the relationship or dynamics of power as a contra contrast to the hege hegemonic uh, view. I'm interested in, rather, rather I'm interested in the transformation of uh, religion itself, uh, independent of the fact that we're talking here about a minority or another, I'm interested in how religion transforms, and in that way I could be talking not only about Jews and Muslims, but perhaps also about Christians, and that's uh, a different, different uh, topic that I won't get into today. So, During the 18th century and 19th century, Jewish customs were referred to indistinguishably as ritual, that is ritus, cult, cultus, and ceremony. Ceremony. <coughs> Though the terms were not new in themselves, and had been used both in popular culture and by German law to refer to religious practice in general and Jewish law in particular, they were now increasingly being used in a new sense. What precisely were these new semantics of ritual, and how did they affect the way religious law was understood, practiced, and regulated? In speaking of ritualization, I rely in part on Talal Asad's work on the transformation of the concept of ritual, which took place during the 18th and 19th century. Asad documents the rise of a modern anthropological sense of ritual, which views religious practice as symbolic interaction and suffuses traditional customs with webs of meaning and signification. The modern notion of ritual replaced according to Asad, and I rely on him here, a more traditional notion of ritual as manual, a set of practices, the importance of which lay not in their meaning, but rather in a precise adherence to the minute and well-prescribed rules of conduct. The transformation in the discourse and practice of Jewish law consisted of two interrelated movements which are characteristic of the modern notion of ritual. First, defamiliarization, a notion defined by the British cultural anthropologist Nedel. Uh, he says, when we speak of ritual, we have in mind, first of all, actions exhibiting a striking or incongruity rigidity, that is, some conspicuous regularity not accounted for by professional aims of the actions. Defamiliarization involved the singling out of certain Jewish practices as peculiar and thus worthy of special attention. During the period, a variety of discourses and practices of defamiliarization developed, which allowed non-Jews and Jews alike to single out certain Jewish customs as particularly superstitious, exotic, or supernatural. The second element of the process of ritualization was symbolization, namely embedding the ritual with symbolic meaning beyond its practical sense. Now, uh, Radcliffe Brown says, with, uh, sorry, ritual acts differ from technical acts in having, in all instances, instances, some expressive or symbolic element in them. The symbolic aspect of the ritual often refers to a supernatural domain, but may also have more uh, worldly <coughs> reference. The two elements, that is, defamiliarization and symbolization, are in fact interrelated, or can be seen as one. Uh, turning mundane practices into unfamiliar spectacles transformed Jewish tradition into a riddle, the hidden significance of which should be deciphered. And conversely, infusing custom with supernatural, exotic, or otherwise enchanted signification turned ordinary traditions into obscure rituals. Ritualization, thus defined, should be understood as a contrapuntal motion to secularization, 
whereas secularization is an attempt to disenchant religious practice, ritualization is an attempt to re-enchant the practice and infuse it with mystery and concealed signification. The two movements are more complementary than contradictory. Secularization criticizes religious practice for its lack of reason, whereas ritualization aims to closely study and decipher the meaning of the mystery. Secularization is based on the premise that nothing is without reason, whereas ritualization stems from the equally modern notion that nothing is without meaning. One may wonder whether a Jewish law was not always uh, a ritual, in the above sense, and whether the labeling of Jewish practice as ritual was a more or less accurate depiction of the practice, at least as it appeared to external observers. Would it not be correct to describe shechita, animal slaughter, as conspicuous regu regularity not accounted for by professional aims? Is it not the case that Mila, Jewish circumcision, was always understood to be to bear some symbolic meaning and signification? So uh, I, I don't have time now to enter this question. I, I guess there uh, historical moments preceding the one I'll be talking, the ones I'll be talking about that suggest that this already exists. But I want to argue that by the same token that we can speak of in modernity about rationalization and still acknowledge the fact that there are earlier moments of this movement. Similarly, we can speak uh, about ritualization even if we can acknowledge some symbolic uh, 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 understanding of religious law prior to the uh, moments I'll be describing, the modern moments I'll be talking about. Um, so, okay. Now, what the paper does at, at length, and I'll have to discuss very briefly, are different moments of ritualization that I think should be understood together. Uh, they happen simul uh, sometimes simultaneously outside of the Jewish community and within the Jewish community. They happen uh, in religious contexts, whether Christian or Jewish, and they also happen within, take place within a more, uh, what we would call a more secular, but in the context of what I want to talk about, we'll say modern uh, context. So the, the first moment concerns, how am I doing in terms of time? Um, nine more minutes. Okay. So the first, uh, first moment I want to talk about concerns the, the Hebraists, uh, a group of scholars who study uh, Jewish Jews and Jewish uh, custom and religion, the most famous names associated with this group and already in the 15th and 16th century are Pico de la Mirandola and uh, Johann uh, Weichlin. Uh, but this group uh, writes throughout up to the 18th century uh, about Jewish uh, religion in a post-Reformation context. So this is an early moment of what I'm talking about as ritualization of Jewish uh, practice. In this literature, Jews were no longer charged for the mistaken adherence to the old covenant, as in Catholicism, but rather for their fabrication of a new covenant, the Talmud, which was far removed from the Word of God. Hebraic literature, in this sense, differs both from the late medieval disputes between Jews and Christians and from the later 19th uh, anthropological and uh, other writings about German, uh, by German uh, Christians, uh, directed in the context that took place in the context of Jewish emancipation. Precisely for this reason, one may see this literature as a distinct phenomena uh, and which, one which, as we shall see, prepared the ground for the transformation of Jews, uh, of Jewish practice from custom to ritual. <coughs> so discussing uh, animal slaughter, for example, in this uh, literature, we see that a lot of interest in this more than, for instance, in the prohibition on pork, because its details do not appear in the Bible and it's less associated with uh, Jewish, uh, with biblical Jewish law. Uh, hence, the mo movement to defamiliarization of the of the practice. And a lot of these uh, treatises are titled uh, "The Peculiarities of the Jews" or "Jews Unveiled," and have this notion of sort of mystifying. Jewish practice, uh, and then uh, some of it. Uh, some of the authors note that the laws of Shita uh, are meant to humiliate Christians by offering them the rear part of the slaughtered cattle, 
which Jews were prohibited to consume. The point is that the slaughtered body of the animal was perceived as a mirror of social relationships and symbolic and interaction. And more can be said about this literature. I talk about later writers in this tradition uh, in the 18th century. But now I want to uh, focus on a different moment in this story, the moment of uh, the Oriental moment, in which Jews are perceived as uh, coming from uh, the desert to the Orient. The association of Jewish tradition with the Orient during the turn of the 19th century marked a clear transformation of the critique of Judaism from theology to anthropology and initiated a new stage of the ritualization process. The claim that Jews were a nomadic people, a nomadic tribe, whose tradition reflect their original habitat became popularized through the writing of German Orientalists such as David um, Michaelis already in the 18th century. The association of the Jewish ritual with Islam and the life of a desert tribe opened the possibility for a sim simultaneous process of secularization and ritualization of traditional practices. On the one hand, <coughs> Jewish laws and specifically the dietary code were explained as a primitive yet proto-rational response to the conditions of the Orient. On the other hand, the very association of the Jews with the exotic desert tribes recontextualized the Jews outside of Europe and infused Jewish practice with cultural significance. Alongside with attempts to give Jewish ritual a rational significance through the science of medicine and nutrition, uh, one may find a parallel attempt to infuse Jewish practice with ritualistic significance. History, archaeology, and the new science of the Orient were brought to bear on the origins of the Jewish tradition. In 1869, the renowned author John Dumichen, who had returned from the expedition in the Nile Valley, published his book, Historisch in Schriften, well, Historical Inscriptions of Ancient Egyptian Monuments in Leipzig. Among the inscriptions were, was a re relief from an Egyptian temple which showed the sacrifices for the goddess uh, Misafris with uh, who was buried in this temple. The, the relief offered a visual depiction of the ancient practice of ritual slaughter, including the knife cut, the pouring of the blood to the ground, and the sacrifice of the animal to the gods. The archaeological artifact, artifact vindicated the opinion held by both Orientalists and lay observers that the Jewish ritual of animal slaughter had its origins not in, biblical, in the biblical word of God, but rather in a pagan tradition of, the, of uh, old Egypt. The Jews who fled from Egypt around 1500 uh, BC incorporated the practice into the religion and carried it with them into the new land. Um, so this is about external observers and then I have a few sections about transformations within Jewish tradition itself. I'll mention one of them uh, which uh, has to do with the rise of uh, Hasidic Judaism in Eastern Europe but also finds its way into uh, Germany. Basically it has to do with the belief and an attempt to reinterpret the, the <coughs> ritual practice of, of slaughter by saying that it has to do with uh, incarnation and reincarnation. The idea is that the animal has within it a human uh, soul and that the only way to release this uh, human soul and allow it uh, to uh, make, uh, resume a human form is to slaughter it properly and consume uh, the, the meat this is something that, although exists uh, in certain uh, mystical notions of Judaism already in the 13th century, becomes public and part of a lively movement of uh, Judaism in Eastern Europe and then uh, to an extent in, in, uh, in Germany, and I think points to an aspect of the re-enchantment of religious, uh, religious uh, uh, practice. Uh, another uh, movement which I won't have time to talk about concerns more sort of uh, ration, so-called rational uh, elements of, the, of uh, Jewish uh, reform and orthodoxy. And here again, we find processes of secularization, but along them process of ritualization, attempts to understand Jewish practice as ritual and hence abolish it, or attempts to understand Jewish uh, uh, ritual as uh, legitimate in the word of God, but then to reinterpret it as symbolic, and in this context, I point, to, among other things, to the works of Mendelssohn and uh, uh, um, uh, Hirsch. So I guess uh, it's time to 
um, wrap things up. In the paper, I suggest that this is not just a history of the perception of religion, the practice of religion, but that this has uh, implications for state law as it applies to the, the Jews. Uh, by naming and viewing Jewish practice as ritual, one could either suggest that it, it has no defense, uh, no defense under the uh, religious practice because it's not religious, it's mere ritus, it's mere uh, ritual, or one could argue, in fact, that it is part, an authentic part of Jewish uh, ritual, but then offer and justify it through its symbolic uh, significance. Uh, I guess, in, in some ways, my, my paper should be read as a meditation on the notions that uh, Heidegger discusses in uh, the fate of religion in the in the modern modern age. So I'll just conclude with this uh, a quote from from Heidegger on this, and uh, I hope that it will shed a little bit more light on what I was trying uh, to accomplish in the paper. So the loss of the gods is a twofold process. On the one hand, the world picture is Christianized, inasmuch as the cause of the world is posited as infinite, unconditional, absolute. So this is religion as supranatural. Na natural. On the other hand, Christianism transforms Christian doctrine into a worldview, the Christian worldview, and in that way makes itself modern and up to date. But the loss of the gods is so far from, is so far from excluding religiosity that rather only through the loss is the relation of the gods changed into mere religious experience. When this occurs, then the gods have fled. The resultant void is compensated for by means of historiographical and psychological investigation of men. So uh, Shai talked about uh, the re-enchantment of legal history and also the enchantment of the world and modernity. Uh, I, my paper is not about re-enchanting legal history, but I do have a story about a magician. Um, <laughs> so I also would like to uh, start by thanking uh, Chris and Kathleen for organizing this conference, although I must admit that uh, in the several, last several months, actually there were several times that I regretted Agreeing to uh, give a paper because I was uh, trying to think about how my bottom up, down to earth uh, research projects are related to uh, methodology and theory. And ultimately, I decided that I'll just share my fr uh, frustrations uh, with you. Talk about two recent uh, research projects of mine dealing with the history of tax law and culture, and talk about the problems that I encountered trying to use the conventional a law and society or law and cultural uh, framework in telling the stories that I wanted to tell uh, um, and uh, using the sources in ways that would be relevant to telling a conventional uh, relational story about the, the relationship between law and culture. So basically the paper, which is uh, quite long, uh, summarizes these two research projects uh, which are, uh, it doesn't say so anywhere in the paper, but the projects are implicitly about uh, one question, which I actually took from Lawrence Friedman for an article that uh, Lawrence Friedman published in the 1990s. And the question is, is law like a refrigerator? Which seems like a frivolous question, but it's actually a, a serious one. It's a, a, about law as technology. So that's my contribution to the law as metaphor uh, that uh, animates uh, this conference. It's a question about uh, the universality of law or uh, about law as something particular. Is law like a refrigerator in the sense that uh, we can't really distinguish between a Norwegian or a Nigerian refrigerator? 
refrigerators work the same way, whether they are in Norway or in Nigeria, or is there something that's embedded in cultural society, it's not a technology. And obviously one of the ways to resolve this uh, problem is to distinguish between uh, different areas of law. And a lot of people have said law is like technology in certain areas of law and not in others. For example, we think of family law or criminal law as embedded in culture and society, but most people tend to think about areas such as corporate law or tax law, which is the uh, I'm interested in, as being a universal, being like technology in the sense that, that they function the same way uh, in every society and every culture. Certainly because tax law is usually studied by people who are influenced by uh, economic, uh, economic literature with its universalizing uh, tendency. Most of the literature on uh, tax law assumes uh, that tax law, whether tax law is embedded, but whether law generally is embedded in uh, cultural society or not, tax law uh, functions the same way in different uh, societies and culture because it, people react, react to the same economic incentives, uh, whether they are Nigerian uh, or Norwegian. And I'm a, I teach tax law, but I'm a law society and a scholar and a legal historian. And therefore, I was always interested in finding a place where I can show that tax law is also uh, culturally embedded. And I begin the paper with actually a story that is not analyzed in great detail because it's not a legal history uh, story, but I think it kind of, it's kind of relevant in the sense that it encapsulates the problems that I also encountered in my uh, two historical case studies. Uh, that I study, um, uh, it's a story about a contemporary case, which actually uh, my wife was involved in, and I think it's a really nice case, that's my story about the magician. So I, I'll kind of uh, talk about it in some detail. So that's a case in Israeli Supreme Court, an Israeli High Court of Justice case from 2004, the Israel Religious Action Center versus the Minister of Finance. My wife, uh, my wife works for the Israel Religious Action Center, which is an NGO involved mostly in state and religion uh, questions in Israel. And the story uh, of this case is a story of somebody called Elzar Bukhatsera, uh, somebody who comes from a family uh, of Moroccan Jews who for, according to some uh, accounts for many centuries, served as intermediaries between God and believers, uh, basically giving advice uh, and also blessing uh, ordinary believers in a way that's quite similar to uh, what happened in other Jewish communities, for example, East European communities and Hasidic rabbis uh, in these communities, as, for example, the Lubavitch rabbi is an equivalent, an East European equivalent of uh, the Abchatzel family in Morocco. And the family moved to Israel and they continued doing what they were doing uh, uh, in Morocco, or maybe not, the anthropological literature says that there's a question whether the tradition was continued or whether this is some sort of new age a, a, a version of traditional Kabbalistic and uh, religious uh, practices. But in any event, uh, this guy, Lazar Protzera, was extremely successful as a saint uh, and miracle worker because a lot of very wealthy people came to, came to him uh, asking for blessings and advice. Uh, and uh, allegedly, he made about 150 million US dollars just by giving uh, advice and blessing to uh, his followers. There were uh, diamond merchants and real estate developers and all sorts of other people. And you know, maybe he knows something that we don't know. We pull in historians, maybe there is something in his blessings. Okay, so anyway, uh, uh, here's, by the way, here's the guy. I took this picture from uh, Google. I downloaded it from some newspaper. I'm not sure that this is his real picture because he's a very secretive person, so that is uh, somebody else. So I'm interested in this because of tax law, and how is this related to tax law? Well, if he made 150 million uh, uh, US dollars, uh, that's a lot of money, and at a certain point in the late 1990s, the Israeli tax authorities uh, wanted to tax him, saying that basically this is in, the money that he got was income, uh, which should, uh, should be taxed, the marginal tax rate in Israel at the time, the uh, marginal income tax rate was 50%, so he was supposed to pay about 75 million uh, uh, US dollars as income tax. 
And he said, no, eh, it's wrong. This is not income. This is, these are gifts. And an Israeli tax law and also an English tax law, which Israeli tax law is based on, gifts are not taxed, okay? The Israeli tax authorities said, this is very similar to what you got money giving advice, just like psychologists or business consultants give advice. Of course, your advice is based on irrational factors. If you think about business consultants, for example, you know, getting a, an MBA from Harvard Business School doesn't mean that your advice is not irrational. Okay, so so uh, they, there was a debate, and ultimately there was a tax settlement. They settled, and Abdozer was asked to pay $5 million instead of $75 million, and some, a large part of the money was actually was to be donated to charities of his own choosing rather than given to the state. And of all my the NGO that my wife works for decided to uh, petition the Israeli Supreme Court and they lost. So they lost for various reasons which I don't have time to go into. But I'm not interested in the case uh, because of uh, uh, its general administrative law tax aspects. I'm interested in one single argument made by Abu Khatzer's lawyers uh, um, in the brief submitted in response to the petition. And that's, based, I'm interested in it because it's a, basically a tax law cultural defense, something that I've never encountered before and kind of spelled me to think deeply about uh, the relationship of tax law and culture. Uh, Abu Zal's lawyer, lawyer basically said that he shouldn't be taxed because uh, uh, he gives his blessings to his followers without uh, asking for anything in return. Some of his followers are interested out of their own generosity in giving a gift to Abu Khatzera. Uh, and the, the gift is based on a spiritual and religious belief, which is rooted in the Jewish tradition that is more than a thousand years old. And what implicitly I think he was saying, if I interpret uh, the argument correctly, was that basically we have here a, a cultural system of categories which are non-Western, uh, non-secular, traditional, the distinction between the market and the private sphere, between business, uh, income, and gifts, uh, is not universal. Different communities, different cultures have different distinctions. And basically, the Western modern secular cult is imposing their own uh, distinctions on a community which doesn't share them. And basically, they are oppressing this community, or oppress especially oppressing Abu uh, Hatzera. And we don't know whether the argument was uh, a, a major argument convincing the ju ju justices to uh, dismiss the case or not, because there were a variety of arguments. But I was saying, hey, this is really neat. I never encountered such an argument. And that, that think about uh, what the implications are for uh, the nature of tax and the fact that suddenly we see cultural defenses raised in a uh, tax uh, law debates, and I thought that in uh, 2004, I thought that I lied about this case because I found that I find a lot of interesting uh, materials uh, in the documents submitted to uh, the Supreme Court and other documents related uh, to the case, but it turned out that uh, there, were not, there was not enough uh, material because a lot of tax uh, issues, tax issues are basically secret, and uh, there are laws in Israel and also in the United States and other jurisdictions which basically say that you cannot uh, individual settlement procedures with uh, individual taxpayers are not uh, public information. And so unfortunately, I had to uh, pursue the matter by looking, using historical examples rather than uh, contemporary ones where the materials are more accessible in the archive. I also like going to the archive as even with all the spirits. It's all this about the fetish of the archive and the desire for the archive, and I had to totally admit that one of the reasons I'm a leading historian is because of the archive. And so I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll now move to uh, talking about the two historical uh, case studies where I actually uh, ask the same question, is tax law universal, is it cultural specific, by looking at historical case studies. But before that, I want to uh, uh, say something about the question that the Abkhazer case uh, raises, which I think is also relevant, was also my problem. Uh, in encountering these sort of materials and also a problem that ultimately this conference uh, is about. So we can ask a lot of interesting, I think, normative and descriptive questions about the Abkhazer story and about the single uh, argument made in the brief by, by Abkhazer's lawyer. The question that I think is relevant uh, to this conference is a question about the use of sources. A okay? basic question for historians, including the historians everywhere, everywhere. 
And the question is, how reliable is the argument? To what extent can we use the argument to learn something about laws outside? When Abdel Zoe was talking about tradition, uh, Jewish tradition, or the culture, he didn't make, make use of the term culture, but he was, he was actually talking about the culture of the specific uh, group, the rabbi and his followers. To what, is, what extent was the lawyer a sincere informant? Uh, was the lawyer an, an inventor of a cultural tradition? So the earlier literature of the invention of tradition, usually we talk about the nation state and the invention of tradition, but obviously you can look at it in many other contexts. And one might say that Abuzel's lawyer was basically a fictitiously described a, a, a fiction about some sort of beliefs and uh, cultural categories and uh, practices of a given uh, social group in order basically to serve the base material interests uh, of his client, the taxpayer. And of course, these are just two uh, alternatives to interpret uh, the argument. An addition possible alternative, not the only one, is to say that culture involved, is involved in the argument in various ways. For example, there's a set of cultural notions usually associated with elites. For example, Orientalism, Orientalist images of both non-Western other, that the lawyer and the audience, the justices, share, and that the lawyer takes and uses uh, to um, uh, actually um, undermine the logic of the Orientalist discourse, because usually we think about Orientalist discourse describing the other, the non-Western other, as different, as being used to uh, uh, support or legitimize uh, the power of the Western secular modern state, but in this case it was kind of turned on its head or twisted because the lawyer was using the Orientalist discourse or the Orientalist images to the extent that, that we found them, that are found in the arguments. Uh, actually to uh, get his non-Western, non-secular, non-modern client uh, not to make access to, to allow his client to win the case. Okay, so these three possible, possible modes of uh, interpretation are not the only ones. One can ask which one of them is correct, and maybe in the specific contemporary setting it's easy to give uh, an answer because we might think that we can go and kind of interview the rabbi or his followers and ask them, do we have different conceptions about the distinction between income and gift? And obviously that's a problem because it's, these are legal terms and Abu Chazel would give us a sincere answer, but maybe observing his followers would allow us to, uh, to uh, answer this question. Obviously when you uh, use historical sources, that's far more difficult. But still, I think that, uh, kind of this, uh, thinking about these questions and inter is interesting in the sense that they, I think, encapsulate uh, one of the major problems of the literature on law and society, more specifically, uh, law and culture that uh, has been written in the last uh, 100 uh, years and that I think has uh, alluded to in, uh, in his, uh, one of his uh, uh, comments uh, in the morning. So as uh, we all know, uh, law society literature and also uh, legal history for the last hundred years has been alternating between various views of the relationship of law and its outside, law and society, law and culture. So for a long time, uh, the view was that law is basically a mirror, law reflects uh, its outside, the economy, uh, society or culture, law is passive, law is a superstructure rather than a base. Um, would say, Marxists would say, and since the 1980s, I think a lot of the literature has moved to viewing law as the most important or active uh, ingredient in the relationship, law being the workshop where cultural notions are being constituted. So, husband and wife, employer and employee, and other notions are, say, some people first created or constructed in legal discourse and then somehow uh, trickled down to general culture or to society. And obviously, since all these versions of the relationship of law and society or law and culture are patently uh, inaccurate. A lot of people have been talking about law and culture and society as being mutually constitutive, as I think the current fashionable uh, way of talking about the relationship. And there was this interesting article that came, uh, came out a year ago about uh, the mutually constitutive uh, approach and, and the fact that it's basically a dead end in the sense that it assumes that it blurs the boundary between law and its outside, and therefore uh, basically prevents us 
from telling a coherent, a causal story about uh, law and changes in law. Uh, so Pirschlag has this interesting, I think, theoretical discussion of why, uh, once we've accepted the mutually constitutive approach, we uh, basically uh, are abandoning any hope of telling a causal story. Although in the article he also says that when legal historians are faced with this problem, with this dilemma, uh, they often kind of legal the way out, they kind of basically say that it's not really a problem because for legal historians, grand theoretical arguments about the relationship of law and society are not uh, important. They are interested in the specific, in the local, and in the particular. Okay? So, Schlag uh, at the end of the paper uh, said basically uh, legal historians find refuge in specific stories, specific case studies, and the argument is that in these specific case studies, the vector of influence, law constructing culture or culture being mirrored in uh, the legal uh, doctrines, the legal institutions, the legal arguments, that's easy to determine. We go down in level of abstraction, and once we go down, uh, go down enough, we just basically uh, find an easy story, an easy cause of story, a simple cause of story uh, that we can tell. So one thing that my paper does is that I uh, actually just give two examples of how even if we go down in the level of abstraction, even if we focus on the particular, uh, the concrete and local, uh, it's very difficult to determine the vector of influence. Uh, uh, so the two case studies that I discussed in the paper basically show how I encountered the problem in the actual sources of determining the causal relationship between law and, uh, and culture. So that's a negative part of the paper. There's a positive part of the paper. The positive part of the paper is an argument that even if we abandon uh, the desire to uh, tell a coherent causal story about the relationship of law and culture, uh, it's still interesting to ask questions about to write a cultural history of law generally and of texts specifically because there are some more uh, shall, more shallower or less ambitious goals that uh, can be uh, okay. So I have to really go with it for the case studies. So the basic basic argument before I go to the form of the case studies is that, that there's a jurisprudential story that can be told about the nature of law, even if you don't want to tell a causal story uh, about the relationship of law and culture, a jurisprudential story about the use of cultural arguments in legal debates, especially debates about uh, income taxation, that's still interesting and relevant and might teach us something about the nature of law that would be interesting. Okay, so the two, uh, moving on to the two examples, I basically summarized in the paper a story about the history of the transplantation of colonial income tax law, how the British basically imposed uh, income tax law in mandatory Palestine, I was looking for cultural arguments in the debates about the imposition of income tax law in mandatory Palestine, and I did find them. I thought that my my sources would tell me whether income tax law is culturally specific or not, and obviously I didn't get a single answer. What I found is that while there were a lot of cultural arguments used in the debates about income taxation in Palestine, uh, arguments about culture in the sense that People referring to local tax moral, bookkeeping practices, literacy, uh, views about consumption, attitudes to survival and standards of living. Uh, not everybody was making the argument. So what was interesting in the, uh, uh, looking at the sources was that lawyers and judges in Antwerp Palestine were not using uh, cultural arguments. They seem to have assumed that tax law is not cultural specific, but that politicians and administrators were, were using these arguments. And while I, I, I discussed it some in the paper, I couldn't really come up with a coherent story about law constructing some sort of cultural image of a local society and its tax practices, or local society being reflected in the legal debates. It was interesting to see that lawyers tend, and so in Palestine at least, tended to treat cultural and cultural difference in a way that's, that was very different than other actors. Okay, so that's the first case study. Uh, the second case study is a story, something I'm, I'm working on right now and I haven't finished. Uh, working on is the history of tax privacy, income tax privacy in Britain uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, I was thinking again of seeing some sort of cultural notion of privacy being reflected in the tax debates or being constructed 
in them, and it was very difficult to me the sources to again determine the vector of influence. But it was very interesting to see the very same rhetorical okay. moves that I saw in uh, 20th century in Palestine seem to have been replicated before, seem to have emerged before uh, in, in the UK, but uh, using different terms. The term for tradition was not culture, but constitution. Um, and also that kind of lawyers were not really involved in the whole question of tax law. There was no tax law in the modern sense in, in the UK in the 19th century. The first tax cases, income tax cases, are actually from the late 19th century. And those are totally out of the picture. It's, only, it's an administrative and political debate about tax law. So tax law actually was an interesting movement of taxation from something that's totally, or uh, not totally, but relatively not related to law, to some, something that lawyers are really involved in. Okay, so I don't, don't have enough time to go over everything because I have to finish, but uh, just in conclusion, um, my paper is basically, the negative part of my paper is just showing, yeah, giving two examples, uh, showing that even in concrete case studies, it's very difficult to, sit, to say whether arguments about uh, the cultural text debate reflected some sort of outside culture, uh, cultural notions which was shared by a given social group, or whether culture was some, some aspect of it was uh, constructed uh, in these debates, whether to further some explicit political or economic goals uh, of uh, given individuals uh, or uh, in any other way. But uh, it's still really interesting to ask how culture appears in legal discourse. Where does, when does culture first appear in uh, legal debates? Culture is a term or uh, uh, in general legal debates or tax debates. What other terms are used? And especially who's using them, okay? And because the question of who's using them is, I think, an interesting jurisprudential culture, actually, an interesting jurisprudential question, uh, because one, once one realizes that lawyers were not using cultural arguments, say, in 20th century Palestine, but for some reason they are now starting to use them, for example, in the case from 21st century that I mentioned, uh, one can ask why, what what does that teach us about the nature of a uh, legal discourse? Is, is it because legal discourse tends, that, and, and tends to emphasize similarity and ignore cultural difference more than other, say, political or administrative discourse at given points in time? Maybe because at given points in time, it's more formalist. And what does it mean for law to become more attuned to cultural difference now in the 21st century? What does it say about the nature of law? is a discourse about the nature of society now compared to, say, the 20th century or even the 19th century. So, uh, I'll end here. Thank you very much. up in a sense along this line, um, maybe uh, the Heidegger at the end of Shai's paper, uh, if the gods flee when we rationalize ritual, we can also say that justice flees when we rationalize law. And um, this brings up the problem of the history of law, or in other words, um, what's the point of trying to understand or rationalize uh, history if that's going to sense chase justice away and so the paper uh, is in a certain way a polemic uh, about the history of law um, but it's about uh, maybe the need to give up on uh, at least a certain kind of history and replace truth with lying so the paper is called the history and the noble art of lying um, in 1886 Friedrich Nietzsche reissued his first youthful brash and as he put it fragwürdig or questionable book the birth of tragedy the birth of tragedy, he informed us in the newly written critical preface, was in many ways a book infected with the passions of youth. Nevertheless, Nietzsche deemed it worthy of republication because it posed a valuable question. One of the first rank, as he put it. Not only of abstract worth, the question was a deep personal question. The book asked, Wozu griechische Kunst, or what's the purpose of Greek art? 
What, if any, is the value of art? Nearly 125 years later, we here are asked to think about the value of an esoteric subdiscipline of academic study, the value of legal history. What is the value of legal history? Well, to ask is to accuse. Even if the conference announcement de denies a crisis and claims that legal history is a thriving discipline, we ask, what is the value of legal history? Why is a rose a rose? Because it is. With Nietzsche reverberating in the background, the question imposes itself. Is this a question of the value of legal history, merely one of academic worth or abstract worth? Is it a personal query? Is it an opportunity for self-justification? Or does it scratch beneath the surface of a scabrous wound? The rationales for legal history, I think, split into two. Um, we saw them in the first panel with the question of the sort of, is it useful? Uh, on the one hand, legal history is useful. It makes us better lawyers. It gives us examples. Uh, it even deepens our understanding of ourselves and sort of a law and society or a law and culture tradition. On the other hand, uh, many of the people here, I think, see the uselessness of legal history as proof of its humanity and beauty. Legal history, let us be honest, most of us say, has no use. Uh, we practice law and or legal history because it's fun. And finally, legal history is an art. And the historian is an artist. We produce beautiful stories that have no use. Right? The art for the art, or art for art's sake. Um, now, these two apologies for legal history take different tacks. The former subordinates law and society, or legal history, scholars to lawyers in a way that many of us find troublesome. The latter promises the scholar admittance into the fraternity of creative souls. The choice between the strategic laborer and the bemused artiste is, of course, no choice at all. For scholars weaned upon the rarefied milk of sacrifice in the name of truth and fidelity to a higher calling, the horror of wage labor is matched only by the charm of spontaneous creativity. Nevertheless, we ought not too quickly to embrace the absolute autonomy of scholarship on the model of artistic narcissism. As Friedrich Nietzsche warns, art for the sake of art, that is an equally dangerous principle. It runs up to a slandering of reality. If one detaches an ideal from the actual, one debases the actual. The beautiful for the sake of the beautiful, the true for the sake of the true, the good for the good, all, Nietzsche says, are evil with regard to the actual world. Scholarship for the sake of scholarship, he says, is a dangerous principle. The danger lies in its seductive powers. For the passion for truth must, like the love of beauty, draw us ever upward and away from this world. The siren call of the ideal carries with it an unavoidable distaste for the actual. History for the sake of history, history as an art, is the mantra of someone who disdains the present. Now, his, Nietzsche's answer is, history not for history's sake, art not for art's sake, but history and art for life. That is Nietzsche's polemic response to the false choice between the usefulness and the uselessness of historical endeavor. But how does history serve life? without being reduced to some sort of utilitarian end, means to an end. Now, the same question applies to the wider and, I think, um, more common and trendier field of law and. The initial rebelliousness felt by those who reminded the lawyers that law happens in life too, and not only in books, faded quickly. It turned out that the social scientific study of legal reality was just as partial an account of law as the conceptual law that it replaced. And now, a new generation of law and scholars has abandoned both the ideal and the real worlds for the more imaginary realms of law as. These scholars, I should say we, are part of an effort, as the conference circular hopes, to, quote, go about gaining new imaginative leverage to enliven the practice of legal history. If our task is to succeed, however, it might help to ask, why must legal history be brought back to life? What, to ask again, is the value of legal history? Allow me to rephrase the question and broaden its scope. The plague of purposelessness is not exclusive to legal history. Not only legal history, but all scientific research is in question in this conference. For what is the worth of the scientific pursuit of truth when one has ceased to believe in truth? 
The crisis in legal history, therefore, merely reflects the crisis of identity, stalking the life of science. What is being asked, what deserves to be asked again and again, is the why of scientific or academic research at all. What for the science of legal history, or what is the value of academic study of law? To gain insight into our question, we turn to Nietzsche and consider the two questions in unison. What for the sciences of law and legal history? What for Greek art? What these apparently dissimilar questions share is a common enemy. Both questions reflect a worry, even a fear, about the power of science. Nietzsche's question works in two directions. First, to ask, what is the significance of the tragic myth among the Greeks? Second, and more importantly, Nietzsche, in his words, got hold of something frightful and dangerous, a problem with horns, but not necessarily a bull. In any case, a new problem. Today, I should say that it was the problem of science. This is all from The Birth of Tragedy. The problem of science is the problem of truth. Truth as science. Truth as the search for reasons behind the visible world of things and events. Science as the belief in reason and the rational order of the universe, nil est sine ratione, as Leibniz would have it, the principle of science, everything that is has a reason. And this is the presupposition of all scientific activity, including the study of ritual. There is not, strictly judged, a science without any presuppositions, says Nietzsche. Why does the world have a reason? Because truth itself is a metaphysical faith. That is, it's a belief in a metaphysical worth, a worth in truth itself. Truth is the latest and the last in a series of metaphysical beliefs. Faith in truth as the world beyond sets the problem of truth and the problem of science within Nietzsche's thinking on ascetic ideals. To believe in a world of truth is to disbelieve the world of common sense. The sunrise is replaced with the Earth's orbit around the sun. Love and depression both yield to reactions from chemical imbalances in the brain. The true world pulls us from the real, and the unconditional will to truth is nothing but the unyielding, quote, belief on the ascetic ideal itself. As Nietzsche writes elsewhere, the one committed to truth in that bold and ultimate sense, as the one who presupposes belief in science, says yes, therefore, to another world, not the world of life. The problem of science is the final manifestation of the ascetic ideal and with it the metaphysical rejection of this world. However, the problem of science, as Nietzsche tells us, is also the problem of history. History is a remembering, a holding on to what is no longer. History is a scientific look past the present moment of life into the misty regions of what was. Why, however, does one look, look back? Why does one remember? Wouldn't it be easier and happier to live simply in the present? We all know of Nietzsche's happy cow, the one who chews his grass, doesn't know from yesterday, and the happy cow lives without memory and history, and only thus does he did not know that he has fallen short of his dreams and goals. The cow lives like a child with no past to disown. Happiness is always a product of forgetting or the power of not remembering. Only forgetting what I have promised and learned in the past allows me the freedom to pursue my dreams in the present. At a minimum, happiness requires I forget the basic rule of memory that my present happiness will come to an end. Against the happiness of forgetting stands the violence of history. There is a level of sleeplessness or chewing of things over of historical sense in which the living is injured and in the end goes under. History kills insofar as it sets man and life under the burden of the past. It limits his freedom and reminds him of his bondage. History thus stands against life. And yet, the memory of history can as well be made to serve life. That is Nietzsche's mantra. To remember is, not, to, remember is to exercise not simply a neutral power, but rather to activate what Nietzsche calls a plastic force that works to turn the past to man's advantage. Insofar as he has the strength, historical man appropriates the past to his present. 
Only by shaping history into his, into his history does man create the world and the culture in which he lives. Man, writes Hannah Arendt, can only exist in a humanly created world, in an artificial world. Or as Nietzsche puts the same thought, only when man, thinking, thinking over, comparing, dividing, uniting, limits that unhistorical element through which first inside that encompassing misty cloud a bright shining light beam arises, thus through the power of using the past for life and of again making history out of what happened, does a first person first become a person. We only are once we create our history. Man only is in a world, to put the point differently. Only as part of a whole, a polity, and a unity does man come to be man. And only in history does man gain a world. A world is a work of art, so might history be as well. Well, at least as history is practiced by historians usually, history is a science. And I, I ask us to at least keep us, ourselves in mind here. We, as historians, or to the extent we are, still seek to tell the truth of something. Through the demand, and thus we issue the demand that history become a science. In the relentless effort to dispel illusion and rend the veil of surprise and astonishment, the scientific approach to history proclaims fiat veritas, heriat vita, right? Live, long live the truth, and long die, well, and then life will die. History seeks truth as objectivity, it turns life into a lifeless object. Against this modern boast of history, Nietzsche has another view. It's that, quote, objective, objectivity and justice have nothing to do with one another. To seek truth above and beyond objectivity, to strive for the doing of justice beyond the neutral and nefarious compromises of fairness, Nietzsche demands that the historian pursue truth and justice beyond objectivity. What, but what is a historian divorced from the facts of history. I'm sorry, Ariel, how much time do I have at this point? You've got uh, 11 minutes. Okay. So I'd like now to just give two examples of what, his, of what might be a Nietzschean history. Um, one from Nietzsche, and one from some current work that I'm doing. Um, the Nietzschean example is Nietzsche's writing on the law book of Manu, the, um, the, the Gesetzbuch de Manus, as he talks about it in many of his writings. And um, uh, as some of you may, or may know, if you know this work, Nietzsche praises um, the laws of Manu and the law book of Manu uh, and um, compares it favorably to uh, what he calls the Christian law. Um, why does he praise the law book of Manu? Well, what he says is that all law must be spoken in the imperative, right? It must make a claim on us, as we heard this morning. Um, and for it to be, for it to have an imperative claim, it must be seen as true. But for something like any law to be seen as true, Nietzsche says, it depends on that. It, it depends on being lied well, right? Because all truth for Nietzsche is simply a lie that has gotten itself taken as true. So that for law to be successful, it has to be a holy lie, a lie that succeeds in making itself believed as true or holy. Okay, so far so good, but why then do we prefer the monocode over the Christian code? Because the Christian code also was a holy lie that succeeded in getting itself taken seriously. Um, well, Nietzsche says that everything depends upon the ends for which we lie, right? Not all lies are the same. The Christian lie for the beyond, based in ressentiment, a lie against life, therefore about equalizing everyone, taking away what our feelings of difference and our individuality, tames man, brings all men down to um, slaves. And it does, in its, in its, in its, in its, in its elevation of equality, and justice as a quality, it denaturalizes the, the, the passions of man. The Manu Code, on the other hand, since most of us don't know it, at least as Nietzsche read it, and his historiography here is, is very weak, um, I describe it much longer in another paper if you're interested in it, 
Um, the essence of it is that it naturalizes rank. It naturalizes the caste system. This is what Nietzsche loves about the Manu Code. It makes the people who are the high class, the Brahmins, feel good about being Brahmins. And it makes the people who are the lowest, the Shandala, feel good about being the Shandala. It makes everybody happy with their class. And it thus naturalizes and justifies difference in the world. And this for Nietzsche is essential because what makes us humans interesting is that we're different. Um, the, the, the way he, the pathos of difference, the feeling of distinction is a, is, a, is a phrase that Nietzsche comes back to throughout all of his writings. The pathos of difference is that life is will to power. That is, life is the will to form. It is art. It is a natural drive for man to assert himself or herself in their difference and superiority over others. And yet this is uncomfortable. We, we get scared with difference. We all know this too well. It's, we, we, we worry about, oh my God, is my difference justified? Well, what the holy lie of the Manu Kodiba does is it justifies the difference. And that's the greatness of it for Nietzsche. By the way, Hannah Arendt has been incredibly, it has a similar view on this, right? In which she says that the problem with modern judgment today is that judgment is impossible today. And the reason is because to judge well, you need to feel yourself superior to someone. And the problem with modernity is that since we all believe we have, everyone has an equal right to judge, true judgment for our end is impossible in the modern society. Um, so Nietzsche offers here an example of history through reading of the modern code. I have, I, I, and what he says is that we need to prefer a code that naturalizes difference rather than one that naturalizes equality. Um, a similar project that I'm working on right now is, is trying to look at the difference between law and revenge. And trying to say that law, law justifies itself as the anti-revenge. Revenge claims that, I, if to take revenge claims that I have a right to judge. I have a right to impose my justice on you. And law says no. Everybody is to be treated equally according to procedures. That's what justice is. Um, Law, therefore, equalizes. Um, all crimes must be punished. Punishment equals the wrongness of the crime. Um, we, 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 we actually ex did, we take the harm out. We take the passion out. And we punish merely the will, the wrong. Um, in this sense, law, as Nozick says in his Critique of Revenge, requires that it be rationalized punishment, justified punishment. What is it against? Extraordinary justice singular justice, the claim of personal <coughs> justice. And so the work I'm doing now is trying to read revenge to restore to us another idea of justice, a non-legal idea of justice uh, in the idea of revenge. The Counter Monte Cristo's justice, right? That, which is, as he says, a art, not a science. What I'm trying to suggest in these two examples is that there's another approach to the humanities-oriented legal history, one that in the service of life allows the historic artist to aim for an artistic justice, one that strives after truth as something great. The historic art, artist must not simply give back the facts and events of life, life yeah, but rather must elevate and glorify life. Only then can the historian seduce others to a vision of a noble and justified life. The value of history is to transfigure the everyday into the beautiful the transcendent and the just. The value of history is a known, perhaps habitual theme, an everyday melody to be described in a spiritual way, to be elevated, to be raised to an all-encompassing symbol, so that from original themes, let themselves be glimpsed an entire world of profundity, power, and beauty. The value of history is to ennoble the world through the art of telling. The value of history is to lie in the furtherance of life. What is the value of Greek art? Greek art, Nietzsche tells us, is the antithesis to the science of history. If science kills living things through its bursting of illusions upon which life depends, the historical art weaves the isolated and lonely facts of existence into its totality. The history of our world must be made beautiful, luminous, and seductive. In other words, the historian must lie the activity inspired by love. 
To live one must love, for only in the shadow of love can man act. Only surrounded by the shadow of the illusion of love does man create, namely in the unconditioned belief in perfection and justice. Only a history that glimmers and shines will succeed at serving life. Only the beautiful can draw us down from the ideal to the embrace of the real. To make the chaos and pain of the real world lovable, to make our suffering lovable, demands the active lie of one who loves that which cannot be loved. The science of history must become the art of history in order to seduce historical man to life. Art, as Nietzsche writes, is the great enabler of life, the great seductress of life, the great stimulant of life. The absence of art would render life unbearable. Hence, for the sake of life, we need art. What in life is unbearable that necessitates the redemptive power of art? The youthful Nietzsche in the birth of tragedy discovered the source of art and all appearing or shining to lie in the unbearable Dionysian insight into the necessary suffering and contradiction of the truth of being, the Selenian wisdom that the best thing for man is to not be born, and the second best to die quickly. From his earliest writings, Nietzsche was compelled to the metaphysical assumption that the true being in Ur Aina as the eternally suffering and full of contradiction needs the beautiful vision, the lustful appearance for its constant redemption. Faced with the unbearable pessimism of the world, of the world pessimism of the world, we have need of lies and of art to live. The core thought of Nietzsche's metaphysics is the unbearable contradiction, the bliss born of pain. It is the root of man's unquenchable need for art as the justification of life. So just one last conclusion. What, if any, is the value of legal history? There is no doubt as to the answer. To let justice reign. To make visible the senselessness of law in the most forceful of ways, and thus welcome in the possibility of justice. In the service of life, the, his the historical artist must tell the harshest truth and spin the noblest lies. And yet, to disclose the beauty and the faithful, uh, faithful unfolding of fate and pleasure in the painful agony of existence is the unique faculty of the artist, not the historian, at least usually. Greek tragedy was such an art, and once faithful to the pain and contradiction in life, and simultaneously celebratory of what makes human life great and beautiful. For historical art to reveal and revel in its revolting rigor, and yet to rouse itself to the resplendent, that is a why and a what for. But such a historical art will, of course, no longer be history. To sanctify the lie and to love the deception, to embrace the glittering wonder of truth and justice in the stark awareness of its illusion is the highest task of the artist. To see law as power and violence and to glorify its justice all the same. Thus does justice overcome itself as mercy. A merciful history born out of love. An untimely thought from the past, hopefully for the future. So we'll take a short break and we'll come back and hear their comments from Professor Gomer. Our events, our events uh, coordinator, it's just asked me to, uh, to make a very brief announcement, a reminder. Uh, please, would you keep and bring tomorrow your main badges? Particularly if you have uh, lunches to pick up that you've pre-ordered, the badge uh, is in some mysterious way, the sign of your entitlement. Right. <laughs> because, uh, as it should be, for uh, purposes of this afternoon's panel in any case, but I believe functionally it has the ticket in it. So uh, please bring your badges tomorrow. Thank you. Gorgeous. Uh, welcome back for everyone who's made it back, <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're going to go ahead for our final session with a commentary and discussion on these four papers, and it's a 
pleasure to welcome our commentator, uh, John Comroff, who is the Harold H. Swift Distinguished Service Professor of Anthropology and Social Sciences at the University of Chicago. Uh, he has uh, written uh, some, many uh, of his books with uh, Jean Comroff, more, many more than I can tell you about, um, but uh, I'll just mention um, a, a small sampling of his work on uh, colonialism, law, politics, uh, historical anthropology. He's the author of the 1992 Ethnography and Historical Imagination, um, the editor of Millennial Capitalism and the Culture of Neoliberalism, and uh, most uh, recently, Ethnicity Incorporated and uh, Work in Progress Theory from the South or How Euro-America is Evolving Toward Africa. Um, and he will uh, comment on the papers, and then I hope we'll have, again, a lively discussion. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to John. Oops. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Speaking of mad. And he said, let there be light, and there was light. <laughs> light, light, light. <laughs> thank you. First of all, uh, like everybody else, thank you uh, to Catherine and Chris. This is a remarkable event, and um, especially you, Chris, come home already. <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> I won't hear him. <laughs> Seriously, um, a, a lot of my own work in, in um, anthropology and, and the lie disciplines has been very um, well fertilized by a conversation with Chris. I really do miss him. It's great to be back. Um, I have a privilege. I have, have, I have four quite remarkable papers to read. Those of you who haven't read them and have simply relied on the verbal presentations, I urge you to read them. They, three of them are really long, uh, but they really repay the effort. Um, in fact, uh, as a member of, of that sort of uh, wandering cast, the commentator, the discussant, um, into which unless I'm included, uh, I, I have really actually been privileged to have quite as fine a, a group of papers. At the same time, uh, I stand here and speak um, with the angst of the outsider. Uh, I'm not a legal scholar, I'm certainly not an historian, and I have not acquired the status yet, the hallowed status of legal historian. Uh, I'm a mere anthropologist. Remember, a practitioner of that discipline that we were told this morning, legal history sort of moved through in one of the stages of infancy. Um, well, a bit like the Rudyard Kipling um, proto-Indian subject, uh, I'm sort of half devil, half child in this, I guess, um, and share some of that unruliness. So forgive me, forgive me for a bit of iconoclasm, but forgive me also for a worse sin, which is starting with a cliché. It is that the triangulation of law, of history, of culture has posed troubling questions for a very long time, indeed from the beginning, with apologies to Ella Fitzgerald. Herodotus raised it, Sir Henry Mayne rephrased it, even Clifford Geertz praised it. So let's do it. Let's fall in law. At least by way of its menage à trois with history and culture. This in order to take us deep into the heart, no pun intended here, uh, HLA is not in what I had in mind, it's the heart not, not just of the matter raised by uh, Roger Berkowitz about the raison d'etre of legal history, but into the matters of theory and method addressed by Shai, by, us, um, by Asaf, and by Peter. Um, actually, Lavi, Likovsky, and Goodrich sounds very much like a, a legal firm in Manchester I wanted to deal with. Um, it occurred to me that law as hides within it an anagram. Rearranged, it reads, a slaw. Uh, what follows is something of a salad. Um, we've had prevented, presented to us four exceptionally rich papers of feast, uh, but a rather diverse feast, and it's one that I do not hope to, nor could not hope to, reduce to a single discourse. Taken together, they pose in highly provocative ways several of the critical questions that face not merely legal history or history sui generis, but the contemporary um, knowledge industry at large. Taken together, too, they address matters very large, how to explain the dialectics of modernity and enchantment, for example, or the connection of law to culture, to matters of less magnitude, like changes in the legal status of Jewish animal slaughter in 19th century Germany. 
Although I hasten to add that the historical minutiae to which the papers address themselves are all made to work, often quite brilliantly, to illuminate big questions. Given the limits of time, it is to the BQs, the big questions, that I shall confine my comments. I do so not in the order of their presentation, but one of my own making, because it leads um, as a narrative to the BBQ, the biggest of big questions. Uh, law as, or as Shai puts it at the end of his paper, and I quote him, is there a way to think of law neither through the prism of law and, nor through the prism of law as? To which one answer, implicit in all four papers, is yes, plainly it is. And the answer is, law is. Of course, with due respect to a recent past US president, a fair bit depends on what is is taken to mean. <laughs> but I'll come back to that later. Since I've invoked the final line of Shai's um, very fine paper, let me begin, begin with his big question. It has to do with modernity and enchantment or more precisely with the problems inherent in presuming with Weber that modernity is about disenchantment. The central point of the piece, as we all heard, is that a Weberian account of Jewish law under the increasingly enlightened conditions of 18th through 19th century Germany would lead us to expect that its practice would become ever less enchanted, ever more secular, ever more rationalized under the purview of the German state, which, he says, is partly true. But in critical part, it is not. And the critical part is indeed critical. How so? Because that law became increasingly ritualized over the period in question. Now, we may ask Schein why precisely this occurred when it did, uh, which isn't fully explicated in the text. But his own concern is with the larger claim, made in reference to an old anthropological argument first enunciated by A.R. Radcliffe Brown almost 90 years ago that ritualization is contrapuntal to secularization and disenchantment, that it re-enchants, it infuses mystery, symbolizes in a manner that demands decoding. Shai is careful to situate the trajectory of ritualization and symbolization in an exquisitely nuanced historical account. So far, so good. I agree with him very fully that contra Weber, modernity has indeed led to a re-enchantment of the law, not only Jewish law, but law sui generis. The point, as we shall see, resonates also with Peter's paper too. But I should like to interrogate further the thesis that the anti-telos of re-enchantment is to be found in ritualization and symbolization. As Shai notes along the way, anthropology is, and I quote him, known for making cultures that are foreign more comprehensible, but it also strives to make that which is becoming ever more familiar into something strange, alien, and enchanted. Now, many of my colleagues would argue, of course, that that is because many familiar things are strange, alien, and enchanted, uh, and require no help from us. But Shai is correct. Critical estrangement is what we do, and we do it for good reason. Bertolt Brecht also did it, in his case, as a deliberate act of dramaturgy, and called it verfremdung, the effort to defamiliarize, to distance, to astonish, thus to strip the ordinary of its self-evident ordinariness. I should like to defamiliarize the idea that ritualization and symbolization are necessarily about enchantment, even though they sound as if they are. Contrary to Radcliffe Brown, there is another new anthropological tradition embodied genealogically in the work of Edward Evans Pritchard, Mary Douglas, Edmund Leach, that treats much of ritual and symbolism as largely technical, repetitive behavior. Indeed, Leach saw ritual as a communicative aspect of all behavior, repudiating altogether the dichotomy between the profane and the numinous. And Evans Pritchard showed that even African oracles, which look to outsiders as the most mysterious, of magical practices, numinous practices of ritual manipulations, are regarded both by adepts and supplicants as purely pragmatic forensic procedures. As Jean Comroff and I pointed out many times, there is a large difference between ritual, uppercase, and ritualization, lowercase. The latter, in many cultural contexts, are less about enchantment than they are about habitual ways of doing things. Uh, those of you who know We the Nasarima, Horace Miner's brilliant essay on American um, domestic rituals will know exactly what I mean. What is more, another social anthropologist, the Venerable Victor Turner, signature voice of this discipline on the interpretation of symbols, was willing to say that if a symbol cannot, uh, sorry, if a symbol can be decoded, it may be a puzzle, but it's not a mystery. 
and it is not in itself enchanted any more than a World War II German cipher was a thing of the gods. It is only a mystery, a true mystery, it only takes on numinous capacities if it resists decoding and demands interpretation, whose reference can never be fully determined. All behavior is symbolic, but only some of it enchanted. In short, there is no necessary relationship between ritualization and civilization on the one hand and enchantment on the other. Let me hasten to add that I'm not saying that Shai's argument is wrong. It may indeed be correct. In order to decide, we need to know more about the substance of ritualization here, its communicative content for those involved, not to mention the numinous dimensions of the, symb of the symb symbolic in German Jewish law. Uh, I'm not, I stress, uh, anti-Semiotic, uh, indeed some of my best friends are Semioticians, um, but I need to know something more about the symbolic in order to decide its theoretical status. But, as I said, I strongly agree with Shai that modernity has not disenchanted or secularized the law. Quite the opposite. In this respect, I think his central thesis is correct and that he's made a master move in going to the very heart of legal modernity in order to make it. But it seems to me that the enchantment of the law is not distinguishable, nor opposed to its technical dimensions or its rationalization. After all, modernity has seen the sacralization of the technical, a, mill a millenni millennial faith in its capacity to construct by magical means, by tiny magical means, a better world for all, even as it destroys every bit as much as it creates. In short, it is incre the increasing fetishism of the law that, in which its enchantments have lain over the long run. By this I mean the attribution to it, to the law, by complex processes of reification, of a life of its own, of a capacity to shape the very forces and the relations that actually shape it, a capacity to make the world in its image, a capacity to determine, for both good or ill, things that happen in that world. One is reminded of Carlos Fuentes, uh, who makes the point that uh, rights depend on power, not power on rights. Uh, the brilliance of the discourse is to invert the appearance and make it look just the other way. Law, in short, takes on the capacity to commensurate, and here, of course, recall, Weber, what modernity is about, is the magicality of commensuration, and thereby to produce rational solutions to what appear to be irrational problems, which is, of course, an entirely enchanted idea. Uh, in short, it is in the hyper-rationality of the law that its enchantment lies. Of course, I hardly need say here, of all places, that modern secular law has always had the quality of a fetish. St. Thomas Aquinas anticipated the point a very long time ago in noting the sacral underpinnings of all natural law. It was to be echoed in Binyamin's critique of the divine violence at its originary core, in Derrida's analysis of the mystical foundation of its authority, in Agamben's concern to find the key to power in the triangulation of sovereignty, the sacrificial, and the juridical although all three of them, of course, I mean Derrida and Agamben, apprehend the law in narrow terms, eliding it with governance in general and enforcement in particular. Arguably, its enchantment, its numinousness, has only become more pronounced as histories of the past give way to histories of the present. And this is the point to which I shall return later on. First, though, if I may, a segue into Peter's paper, which picks up on many of the same themes. Peter's stated concern, and I, I'm citing his written paper rather than the presentation, which is again an absolutely exquisite piece of writing and um, mind-blowingly erudite. Peter's stated concern is why has the history of legal spectacle, uh, of the juristic use of images and performances, not yet been written? It's a very good question, but it's one that I am ill-equipped to answer. I've had it just now, but I'm truly ill-equipped to answer it. Um, but hidden behind that question is uh, another, another BQ. How are we to com comprehend, without simplifying it, the relationship between law and spectacle, as mediated by the image? By contrast to Shai, Peter is concerned with ritual, uppercase, rather than ritualization, lowercase, with sacrality, solemnity, spectrality, even the spirit world. He comes very close to a functionalist contra Foucauldian thesis. Lawyers, I quote, need the trappings of sovereignty, the machinations of spiritual causes. 
Images give law its power and glory, its aura and its effect. No image, no law. Now, of course, um, there would be a number of people that would debate that position. I, however, find it compelling. In this respect, he's careful to say law is sovereign, it's hierarchical, it's transcendent, it rules, as opposed to the executive, the administrative, uh, the or economic, which merely govern. The former belongs to theology, the latter to economy, at least if I understand the argument correctly. Now, structural functionalist anthropology, if I may be um, permitted the indulgence in my own, the, the history of my own discipline, uh, which unlike legal history, by the way, has had a lot to say about the theatricality of the law, has long made the argument that an explanation for all this lies in a counterpoint, one which goes back to Shai's title, Law as World. Now, the argument is almost too simple to bear iteration, so please bear with me. Um, since any social universe, it goes, is predicated upon a metaphysic of order, um, quotidian enactments of the law, uh, not uh, the definite article, just of law, um, are as much about constituting and representing that order as managing any breaches. This, to channel Durkheim, is society worshipping worshiping its normalizing and normativizing self, thus to reproduce its transcendence as a living abstraction. Uh, Durkheim also argued, as did uh, Norman Spalding this morning, uh, that it is only with contestation, indeed only with criminality, that law and society actually ever know themselves. But also, and here is the counterpoint, uh, law is the metapragmatic means, the cosmic tautology, by which the obligatory is rendered desirable, the desirable obligatory. Now, although Peter doesn't quite make that argument, uh, something fairly close emerges. But this raises the problem of history. For structural functionist anthropologists, these were universal truths about law and ritual. It is not always clear when Peter is talking historically and when his history is actually supra-historical, above it all, so to speak. Thus, for example, for example, his claim in the written paper that no law is without hierarchy, no hierarchy without law. Uh, of course, African comparative legal scholars would wonder how you deal with the new with the turban. Uh, most of the classics are modern comparative legal anthropology. Um, or, for that matter, in the commentary on Macpherson, again, a brilliant commentary, that law everywhere requires publicity, spectacle, uh, spectacle, theatricality, in order to be the law. Well, does it really? Empirically speaking, I can think of several counterexamples. Personal status courts uh, in Egypt, for example, as described quite brilliantly by Hussein Agrama, have since the 1970s heard all their cases in private. Um, and there has emerged a jurisprudence uh, under which this has become the law. As Agrama notes, there's no easy explanation for this, especially since Egyptian jurisprudence at the time w was looking, as it continues to do, Euro-liberal in the extreme. Um, but nonetheless, there's a clue here. It's a clue to which Peter, in fact, himself leaves a trace. Now, he sustains the functional argument for the necessity of imagistic spectacle by pointing out that despite the fact that in the Macpherson case, Justice Sweedy, um, no, Tweedy rather, was excoriated by the Privy Council for rendering a legal process private, that his decree needs he stood. In short, that the sanctity of the law, the law that rules this, its sovereignty, was asserted by the Privy Council, while the administrative act, uh, i.e. the decision, um, which is merely administrative, was allowed to stand. Now, the question is, why was that decree nisi not part of the law? For uh, the litigants, it certainly was. For uh, Justice Tweedy, no doubt, it was. In other words, by what definition is this eliminated from the law? And that becomes an interesting question. And here, I think, there is a clue, if I may put Peter Goodrich and Walter Benjamin together. Right? Um, what it reminds me of very clearly is Benjamin's speculations about the admiration for the great criminal and the difference between the great criminal and ordinary crime. Recall, Benjamin argued that what made the great criminal great was that he or she, Benjamin read about he, um, that he did not simply break the law, but he offended the law in the upper case, the definite article, the regime of legality on which the social was predicated. Ordinary crime is just ordinary. It's no less law, but it is not the definite article. Herein lies the distinction between the law and law. 
definite article, upper, uppercase, the quotidian, lowercase. And I think that what Peter is talking about here is the difference between those two things. Between the law, its ritualization, the, the momentous, the moments at which the law as regime of knowledge and practice is called into question, enunciates itself, um, and enacts its being, and those everyday moments in which it may or may not ritualize itself. And here again, it takes us back to ritualization in precisely the sense that the Chai intended it, which is again a brilliant insight, which is to say that the law takes its numinous part from its ordinariness, from the very fact that, and Peter makes this argument very, very powerfully in um, the, the paper, that it hides its numinous quality precisely in the fact that it manages the nature of the world without showing the fact that it is doing it. That, of course, again, is the definition of the fetish. Which perhaps explains why, uh, and I don't think Peter got to this in, in the presentation, why, uh, in fact, um, there has not been a history of this of law spectacle in, um, in America. He blames it, he calls it uh, a word that I've never heard of, adiaphorism. Is that how you pronounce it? Adiaphorism. Today. Today. Okay. <laughs> and tomorrow? <laughs> Bediaphorism and CDAphorism on, on Sunday. Okay. Um, I think the point being, he argues, that it is the pragmatic mindedness of um, the, the uh, scholarly academy in the US uh, to which this is, is um, attributable. Now, that is probably correct, but the question is why? And it seems to me that the answer lies again in the question of law as world, or rather in its inversion the world is law. We are living in an increasingly legalized world. And again, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and one in which so much of the everyday procedures of life are rendered judicial. Politics, especially if you come from the global south, is entirely judicialized. Uh, citizens are taught to think of themselves as in judicial terms. Chris will have heard me say this. In South Africa, a law train goes around the countryside from remote village to remote village, persuading people to deal with ordinary problems, whether it's ARV, um, uh, ARV drugs, to issues of, of labor con uh, compensation, to not having um, actually slept with their, their partner last night, as a legal problem. Your thought that you are made into homo uralis has become so ordinary again as not to become noticeable that the world has become law. The world has become judicialized in the most quotidian senses. Again, the fetish rises. It is law that will commensurate. It is law that will, res will resolve everything. In many parts of rural South Africa, um, people have on their shelves, I'm talking about huts in the, in the countryside, the little red book. The little red book is the redacted constitution. And it usually stands next to the family Bible. And so anybody looks at it or reads it, but its presence is right in the domestic set. It's right at the heart of the altar and the heart of the, of the domestic domain. In that sense, this is where, to go back, uh, is where the numinousness of the law lies. It's magicality, it's fetish, the notion that it will commensurate. And it seems to me that because law has become this, because the law, has become so rare in the context of the everyday, the moments of challenge, that in fact its spectacular nature belongs to the domain of something else, of, of, of um, faith, of sovereignty, etc. And hence becomes, as it were, um, slips below, as Bourdieu would have said, below uh, the level of the notice. Um, I would say, in, uh, in a reflection on this morning's conversation, that much of the discussion, much of the debate that occurred this morning uh, was in, in effect or predicated uh, in effect on a slippage between the law and law. Um, and indeed, it seems to me that if legal, uh, uh, legal his history is going to take itself seriously as an analytic and well-founded uh, epistemological practice, sustaining and understanding that distinction, indeed um, interrogating the relationship between the two things, becomes absolutely fundamental. The fact that the world confuses it is understandable. That is where the domain of legal strategy lies. That's where the domain of sovereignty and empowerment lies. Uh, legal academy, however, is not the world out there. And distinguishing and rendering not pro deep promiscuizing uh, promiscuities in the world of practice is often what critical estrangement does. Uh, that, uh, Shai, is why anthropologists critically estrange everyday things. Um, Fetishes, the originary form, of course, are cultural objects. So is the law, a cultural object, again, a different article, which takes us directly to Asaf's very thoughtful disquisition on the law and culture. Now, Asaf's a little apologetic about it, was at the beginning saying, well, he's really dealing with case, etc. But these are three very interesting cases, and he asks exactly the right question with it. He asks the question, if you take 
culture, um, cultural defenses, and I'm running out of time, so I, won't, I was going to talk about cultural defenses, which have become epidemic across the world, largely because um, we have, we've ended Benedictine history, right? The, the, the history of, of the nation state, as uh, Benedict Anderson understood it, is over. We now live in plurinations, and cultural defenses become epidemic in plurinations. Um, but that's another, it's a topic for another time. Uh, the, the question he asks, though, is how does law relate to culture? And of course, this is a question that depends largely on one's conception of law and one's conception of culture. Um, interestingly, um, Asaf defines culture, but he doesn't define law, uh, which seems to me to be an interesting juxtaposition given the nature of, of this disquisition. Now, he defines it in a way that um, actually is perfectly acceptable, I mean, all definitions are perfectly acceptable, depending what one argues from them, but it is a very particular definition. It is, culture is a set of ideas, beliefs, symbols, values, social norms and practices, which are often, un often unconscious, are relatively stable and static, are widely shared by members of a given social group. It is a category, he says, distinct from politics and economics, and of course by extension from law. Now, um, again, uh, this is a, a, the kind of definition that was fairly current in, in anthropology <clears throat> in, the, in the 1970s and 1980s. And, of course, by definition, by putting outside of itself uh, social institutions, social practices, social domains, social discourses, like politics, economics, and the law, it then creates the problem that Chai has had to address. What is the relationship between the two? And as he says, and I think he's absolutely right, if you define culture in that way, there is no theoretically principled answer to that question. It will always be indeterminate. Why? Because in effect, they don't exist as exterior institutions to one another, they part whole relations. There is no law that isn't within culture. That is to say, there are no terms by which law can construct itself without being within culture. Now, contemporary anthropological definitions of culture pay much more attention to its openness, to the fact that, that culture is a field of signifying practices that are variably empowered. Power lies within culture, not outside of it. Politics always inhere in the cultural, just as cultural inheres, in, culture inheres in the political. So those signs are differentially, um, differentially empowered. Some signifying practices are hegemonic. Some are ideological and open to contestation. Some are the object of consciousness. Some are the, are the object of unconsciousness. And indeed, the way that those fields play themselves out literally is the, 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 uh, the ground on which the struggle over culture, the struggle over law, in fact, um, itself take shape. Now, there is, again, a large literature on exactly how this, these things do play themselves out, uh, and I won't repeat them now, except to make the point that if one is to understand the relationship between law and culture, it begins by situating law within culture and then asking the question, what is the relationship between the two? Not culture and, but how within culture is law made, how is it transformed, how does it take on its hegemonic qualities, when and under what conditions is it contested, and by what means, and in the process, how in turn does it shape culture. This is a very Zizekian problem, which is to say, culture by virtue of being, at least law by virtue of being within culture, is never contained entirely, but it can never be a reflection, no more than a wheel can be a reflection of a motor car. Right? There's a part whole relationship to, to them. They make each other, and they make each other in dialectically open ways. That is to say, their relationship is always one of excess, one of contestation, one of politicization. That, after all, is what the struggle for the law is. To me, as a, as a mere anthropologist, the law is a site of struggle. It's not a thing at all. It takes on its definite article purely by a moment of reification, which is always unstable, which is being contested at the very moment of its enunciation. There, that is precisely why ritual with a capital R only inheres in the, the moments of that definition, the moment of reification, which of course, like all dialectics, contains the seeds of its own internal contestation. I hasten to add, lest anybody misunderstand me, that I'm not using dialectics in the Hegelian or the Marxian sense, but rather in a post, um, actually a post-Marxian sense, which and hence Zizek, which always contains excess, always contains indeterminacies, always contains uh, superfluities. And it is those things, and understanding and theorizing and ethnographizing those things, and particularly ethnographizing those things, because after all, the production of knowledge, with apologies to Nietzsche, is always a, di a dialectic between the inductive and the deductive, again, an underdetermined one. It is only that by which legal history makes itself interesting as an intervention in theory, whatever else it may do, it's to be an intervention in theory, figuring out 
the nature of that dialectic, of its superfluities, of its excesses, of its redundancies, of its indeterminacies, as well as its other determinations, is what makes legal history interesting to the world beyond itself. And it is profoundly interesting to the world beyond itself, particularly because of the contemporary fetishization of the law. Now, I'm running out of time, so let me turn finally, uh, because this actually does take us finally to um, Roger's, again, very impressive reflection. Um, I, I was speaking to him this morning about it over, over breakfast, and um, already said to him that it may not have been published, but uh, it's going to be cited in, in, in the chapter on next book already, because it, it really raises some extraordinarily interesting uh, reflections, not merely on Nietzsche, but on the question of why knowledge regimes the law. Now, of course, what Roger, um, Roger's BQ is the BBQ of all, the biggest question of all, and that is what is legal history actually for? Um, and in that sense, um, it is a reflection that illuminates all of the other things that we've spoken about, and it does so in very interesting ways, because all of these other three papers have actually prefer, pr provide, I think, quite profound answers to that question. Roger's own answer is one I agree with absolutely, if I may, however, allow, be allowed a, a friendly amendment, which is an expansion. Right? Um, his answer is, and it's del delightfully direct, um, just as his paper is an aesthetic and analytic delight, um, it is, quote, to make visible the senselessness of law. Now, as I say, I agree fully, if we may add to senselessness, again with Binyamin, it's, that is, laws, cap um, inherent capacity for violence, for erasure, for juricide, for killing by legal means. But following what I've just said in response to Asaf, following the effort to conceptualize culture as I have, there is a further step to making visible the senselessness of the law, one which evokes a very powerful ghost, the ghost of Franz Fanon. It is to make visible the processes too by which the forms of the law, in all their ritualized uppercase and ritualized lowercase guises, become portrayed as sensible become um, the hegemonic, the taken-for-granted means by which right is exercised, by which property is made private, by which violence is sublimated into right. After all, the trick of senselessness is its own inversion. That, again, is the trick of a fetish. It makes the appearance of a camera obscura or too real. The senselessness of the law, after all, is its numinous quality. It is its capacity to elude easy interpretation, but the process by which it becomes normalized, by which it becomes hegemonized, by which it becomes homogenized and rendered into precisely the mistake that we all make, the promiscuous movement between the law and the law becomes thinkable and possible. Which finally takes me to one last comment, and that is, the question of law and through law as to law is. Now, to the degree that the world is law and the world is increasingly becoming law, the question isn't, I think, law and or law as. It is what we understand and how we theorize the world once the world, once law is the world and the world is law. Uh, once it becomes increasingly true that that illusion and it is an illusion, of course, because there's a lot of it exists outside the law. But nonetheless, the degree to which that illusion takes hold. I recall Eric Fromm, Beyond the Chains of Illusion uh, is the challenge of all critical scholarship, of all estrangement, of all defamiliarization, of ephemdom, of astonishment. Uh, and if there is any truth in um, whatever it is history pursues, then presumably that is what we have to decode. Why precisely law is? what it means to say that law is, when the world becomes law, what sorts of analytic and critical and especially challenges of estrangement that poses the scholarly community, not only within legal history, but across the entire knowledge regime of which we will partake. You're supposed to be. Okay, but can you hear me? Hear. The question is whether. Should be mic. Yeah. That, that's a mic, supposedly. 
Is it? No. <laughs> 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 okay. So, thanks. This is uh, this is great. Uh, you brought the papers together. I, I just want to briefly respond to the question, the small question you referred to me. Then the BQ, BBQ. Uh, I'm sure other people will have uh, some things to say. I'll be brief. Um, so you ask, and I think that's a really important question. When I talk about virtualization, I'm talking about two different things. I'm talking about symbolization, and I'm talking about the enchantment, or I'm talking about, your, and you're saying they're not the same. So, um, and you cite anthropological theories that suggest that, and, I'm, and, I, and they exist, and I'm sure they're right. So, the, the, uh, the, the short answer, or the specific answer, is that the, in the text that I'm studying, sort of the historical text that I'm studying, the two are brought together. So that would be the easy answer. So that these processes take place together historically. Now, there's another question whether they belong together conceptually. And um, there, I'm not, I'm not sure. But I, I'd like to begin to think about this. That is that uh, enchantment creates a, a twofold world, right? That the, the practice is not the law itself, but rather there's an other world in which the practice has its meaning. So the slaughter of the animal is not the real thing. The real thing is reincarnation of souls. Now, symbolization splits the world into two in a different way, but still splits the world into two and allows for the enchantment. Symbolization says that practice is not the practice. The practice symbolizes something else that we need to account for. And so there's this uh, duality that is open that then allows for an enchantment or not, but that that possibility is implicit in the symbolization. So that's a point, and I thank Lord for that. Um, the, the, the second point is uh, about theories of uh, rationalization and uh, ritualization, or enchantment and disenchantment. And here, just briefly, I think that uh, the, the distinction cuts through sociology of law and, and history of law. So we have Weber on the rationalization side, and Durkheim in his discussion of society as God on the enchantment, and then we have Foucault, and Agamben, and Kelsen, and Schmidt, and Arendt, and Benjamin, and Rochelle, and what have you. But there are theories that try to, to uh, secularize and rationalize, and there are theories that try to understand law and other things by enchanting them. And I think that this, this tension is, is important, even though I accept what you say, that is that rationalization has an enchantment effect in itself, and I think that's, that's a very important point, but different from the one uh, that I was making. And then but the last one I just want to make briefly, and, and maybe I'll probably come back in the discussion, and it refers both to your general comments and specifically to Roger's paper. And that is that, that you say, and Roger uh, says the same in, in his paper, in a stuff that's too, the that law is always culture. And, uh, and by that we understand that it belongs to the realm of the human, uh, that is human made by culture. Or Roger says, history is human made. And this is how we need to understand it, as, as an activity, as a being, as a, as a life. But religion poses a question about that. And, and, it's a, and it should form a question, even for us who are not religious and don't care about religion at all. And, and that is the possibility that we think about law, not as man-made. And about history, not as man-made. And about culture, as a specific reading of law and history as man-made. And so then the question is, what happens when we allow ourselves to think of law, not as divine, because we're too secular for that, but as given, or as, or as history is given, or uh, not culture, because culture is already has this notion of human-made, man-made. But so, so these are the questions that, that, that open themselves, and, and then it would be a um, critique of secularism uh, to, to raise these questions and to show how, for instance, to think that the, 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 the role of the thinker or the scholar or the scientist is to question ritual with capital L, to show ritual with small l, or to do the same and, and to criticize fetishism, is part of a secularist uh, reading of law and uh, an understanding that what we need to be doing is secular, secularized uh, understanding of law. And the question is what would be an alternative to that which is not on the enchantment. Let's open that to our uh, 
uh, patient audience, and um, I guess we can take these over if there are people who want to speak. It's all because we didn't have coffee at the break. <laughs> I knew we could count on some of the Barbara Welke. Barbara Welke, no, it's not. Barbara Welke, University of Minnesota. Uh, I, I have a very particular question for us all. Uh, I was struck in the uh, privacy uh, case about the sexual imagery in the language. Uh, which really, and the, the place I first noticed it, um, now I'm going to in the wrong place, just a second. Um, and then I started looking for it. Oh, okay, so here, on um, page 62, um, at the bottom, um, you say, rushing into the counting house, it spreads wide the ledger. Uh, and, and then I started going back and looking at, you know, at all of the other language. And it's really, as I said, it struck me as powerful. And I, and I wondered about it and uh, wondered what you thought about that. Um, I think the images actually exist both in the sources and also in the theological modern discussion of the story of modernity and the story of the state is penetrating and kind of, you know, violating the private sphere. Uh, so it's actually something that's also historical, but also kind of modern, modern to look at the relationship between the state and the subject in its gender language. I kind of, it wasn't a major theme for me. Obviously, it would have implications about the relationship between culture and tax privacy in the sense it does kind of show you that ultimately culture, the outside is kind of the primary source of, of the story. And not, it's not a story about lobbying at a place where uh, uh, you know, the images are constructed. I haven't kind of done any, kind of, I, you know, it's not a major point for my story, which is, the part of privacy is still not, it's, it's work that has been ongoing and kind of just barely scratched the surface. Once you kind of think about this issue, which nobody has attempted to kind of study properly, I think, there are a lot of stories of privacy which focus on in the relationship, the history of the right of privacy in the 19th century, in, the, in, in relations between individuals, but his, his sort of privacy in the state, especially in that context, hasn't been aired uh, yet. So for me, kind of, a, just this is just a report of, you know, preliminary, uh, you know, preliminary collection of some some of the sources, and I haven't, you know, haven't done this yet. It was just kind of just reporting that I found a problem and kind of the relationship between culture and law in this in this topic too. And thinking about the gender aspects of the language and what that type of images are, are used and what do they say about the relationships is something that I have to do once I can correct, correct all, all the sources. You know, so, and I also have to do a comparative, you know, once I, when I do it, uh, when I complete the project, it will hopefully be comparative and I look at the difference between the United States and the UK and hopefully some of it, some of the difference may, would also be a gender difference. For example, you know, that does, far more, far less tax privacy in the United States until late 19th century. It may have had a connection to images of, of Americans that's different than, than English and so on. Yeah. But certainly, the, the, the stuff is really nice. It's kind of, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of layers to it that, has to, that have to be, to be studied and answered. because it seemed to me that there are a number of maybe submerged gendered stories here and I know that I've been noting some of the language I mean not only in in um, in the task piece but in the um, man-made <laughs> culture and and more generally in the many juxtapositions we have of, of what seems like a, the, a masculine law and a feminine culture and also in the spectacle that we have here as well I noted in conversation with several people as well, that Theory Day here at Legal History Conference is, a, as one of our fellow conference goers said, a, it's a, looks like a barbershop quartet. We had a lot of a male theory, and I might break into doo-wop over here as the girl singer, but um, 
but otherwise I'm keeping time. And I think we might think something about about um, some of the, the what uh, the subtext uh, as we're thinking about this. But I'll take more audience. Lisa, I have a, I have a question about spectacle. I think I'll laugh. Can everyone hear me? I usually don't have a problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I was curious about, and I was curious about this when I was reading Peter's paper, and then John, when you were talking about the Egyptian courts that happen all in private, and I was, when I was reading the paper, I was thinking about the Supreme Court and the debates in the United States, and the debates among the justices about whether to open up to televise the um, oral arguments, and most of the justices adamant that they not be televised, and I was thinking, that spectacle can also be anti-spectacle, right? That that the very inaccessibility, the very privacy, the very fact that you don't have access to it, that it is a special place with its own rituals, with its own practices that are not actually open to the public is part of what makes that spectacle so effective and powerful. At least that's what they believe, right? At least the justices believe that something is at stake in publicizing and, um, uh, and broadening the, the scope of availability of their oral arguments. Maybe that's not true, but they seem to have something invested in the belief that the privacy endows them with greater power in some way. So I just want to think about what both of you think about Both of John and you. Oh, John. <laughs> Go ahead, John. My answer is yes. <laughs> I, I think that there are any number of contexts in which privacy and closure empowers the law. And again, definite article. And, uh, but I think, to, I th I think here, um, Peter's point is really important, which is to say there are any number of contexts in which the absence of the image, the withdrawal of the image, hints at a form of publicity by virtue of erasing it. And I think that's exactly what happens in the Supreme Court instance. We all know they're there. We've been, uh, we've been given any number of imagistic bases in order to think that. But the withdrawal of the image becomes an enunciation of its power. And Peter actually argues that in the latter part of, of the paper. Uh, th that's one of the reasons I suggest reading it. But I don't want to answer for you, Peter, because you have a much better one than do I. Uh, so I hope people don't normally have trouble hearing me, so if the peculiarly male-looking device there could be put away. Um, the image, television cameras came into the American courtroom in the McCarthy hearings on, on the back of um, war crimes trials. And there's an amazing history of um, how both at Nuremberg and in the McCarthy hearings, the camera brings the world into the courtroom. And the problem with that in the McCarthy hearings, if you look at the footage, are quite extraordinary, is that it, it, it distracts and it decomposes the highly regimented theatrical order of legal proceedings. So a court and a trial that, that doesn't have the camera is a court and a trial in which everybody has their place, uh, except when the judge jumps off the bench. <laughs> it is known who is talking to whom and in what order and indeed in what language. So that I think the Supreme Court's fear is precisely a fear of the interdisciplinary of the outside, of a taking away of this control and um, a movement of culture society visibly into the, the courtroom. Um, as, as to the holding of hearings in, in private, um, and all of this interest in the image comes, curiously, with a, a feminine accent, Janus, uh, Anglorum, or Janie Anglorum, which is uh, Selden's book about common law, the feminine in common law, precisely in that title, um, arrives uh, loosely at the same time as the translations of the Egyptian hieroglyphs and Hierapolo and, and the Enigmata, um, at a time when the, the image is something feminine. Um, the image is a woman, the, the image is a face. I mean, that there's a a fascinating theological kind of denunciation of the image precisely 
for the, this opening up, but I, I guess the way that I would see the camera, which is coming, which is coming because uh, every laptop has a camera, every phone, but particularly the laptop because the courts want to be on the internet, so they are visible. You, know, you just have to turn the, the laptop towards them, as it were. I, I think that it, it, it's simply a matter of time, and what, what does that mean? Well, you know, I think that's, that's good for us, because it, it takes away that highly regimented theatrical control and, and broadens it into something that is less amenable to this um, textual solemnization and this very rigid hierarchy of performance, which is, is still being held on to. I'm just going to add a footnote. I, I, the, the, the notion of, of, of Nuremberg and, and, um, and the McCarthy era is very interesting because those are both moments in which the law is in question. And in <laughs> Nuremberg, specifically, it was about creating a new notion of a legal regime. Of course, McCarthy was about the ostensible potential destruction of American law. So those are, those are two really interesting images in which law in the upper case and, and ritual in the upper case do converge in the publicity of the image. Uh, on the other hand, the, um, the banalization of what's a judge Judy and judge whatever um, has led to any number of discourse. Is this really law or is it just basically daytime comedy? Um, and again, in effect, that's raised a very interesting question uh, about precisely whether this is really the law, if it is made public in, in this kind of banalized notion. And there's again a, another no, a, sort of Benjamin subtext there too. I don't know why Benjamin is so much around today, <laughs> nor is isn't that much around my life, but um, there is really the art, mechan the art and the mechanical reproduction um, and the rendering of the banal it, it does raise the question of what exactly is law and what is drama. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think you remember me from this morning. Um, <laughs> uh, just to, uh, the Judge Judy might be, one, one reading of her might be um, uh, an evidence of an everyday appetite for despotism in a world where we are all instruments in the longer agents, given the sacralization of, the, uh, of, the of technology. Um, uh, but that's actually sort of, well, that's sort of a segue into what I was talking about. <laughs> <what I'm> <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, uh, and that is, in the, in the thematic of the civilization of, of, of technology as the, the sort of mark of the modern, um, uh, I wanted to ask a question, sort of maybe to tie us to the theme to tomorrow morning's panel. Uh, one of the themes I hope we'll discuss in tomorrow morning's panel. And that is the question of embeddedness, to use the term that Carl Polanyi uses. Because, Shai, I think that's, in some ways, you've, you've framed your questions as uh, in, the, in the very question of enchantment and secularization. Um, but Asaf and Shai, I think you're both asking questions about embedded life. I mean, that, that sort of way of being in the world that we don't have any categories to describe anymore because we've already been disenchanted. So to give you an example from my uh, case of colonial law in India, and this speaks, I think, especially to Asaf's point, um, that, or questions about law and culture, I would say that um, at least uh, to think about the ways in which cultural defenses and culture as a name for politics, or, or what uh, Arjuna Padurai would call culturalism, uh, the use of culture in that way, uh, for me at least, and you'll hear more of this tomorrow, is the effect of a certain kind of sacralization of the technical, which is the institutionalization of that thing we call the economy. And you can't think um, and of course, uh, <laughs> you know, Ethnicity Inc. is sitting right here, so I don't need to elaborate this argument much. Can we become our uh, books? This is very unfortunate. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but, 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 so I really think that the, the third category there for thinking long culture is economy. We have to in this context. So to just give you one example of the ways in which we might do, say, a, a genealogy of the idea of the gift and to problematize your wacko figure that, that you talked about, um, in late 19th century India, there is an incredible amount of acrobatic jurisprudence over the institutionalization of the law of mourning uh, to establish a gift given in perpetuity. And this becomes a real problem because the richest people in India, mercantile groups, vernacular capitalists as I call them, establish uh, indigenous forms of social welfare like temples, uh, rest houses for uh, uh, travelers, religious travelers, um, uh, cow shelters, etc. All of these are dedicated to deities, and all of these are general, generally have vast tracts of land that uh, uh, bring rent 
an income and rent. Now, the income of that rent can always be used to, even if you give a gift for social welfare, can be used to defray debt in your family firm. It can be used to set up more retail uh, locations. It can be used for credit, and then it will always return. But the fact is there's a coarse boundary between what is considered social welfare and what is considered profit. Um, what the legal ac acrobatics of the British do in a series of high court decisions in the late 19th century, from the Privy Council and the Bombay High Court in particular, is um, uh, trying to figure out how you can establish the law of mortmain to a gift that will be given in perpetuity that can never revert back to the family. How can you code these things as trust and mortmain? And the way they do it is by defining the Hindu deity, the idol as they call it, as a legal subject. Okay, and that that is the that is the fetishization that that uh, John Farmer was talking about. So um, you they they produce the idol as a legal subject, a legal subject whose intention can be discovered in the sort of you know uh, uh, interest in maintaining his house or her house for that matter, Polly. It's also us. Um, and, uh, and 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 so so. Uh, I give this as an example of a, the ways in which um, a kind of secular technical worldview recodes an embedded way of life in which the distinction between public and private, and in the 19th century, Charlie Downs Act, 1890 in India, um, establishes, defines charity as a gift for general public utility. Public utility. So the category of public versus private is, uh, is absolutely at play there. So how do you even think about these practices? Or these nomoi that are um, that are that don't apply in public-private distinction. That don't uh, that don't apply categories of charity and profit. So I think it's just it's just a big way. It's another BBQ. How do, you know, how do we think embeddedness? I just wanted to introduce that as it's an anthropological question, perhaps more than anything else. And I just had a quick question for Peter because it was so compelling. Icon and Oikos. And if uh, Oikos is the realm of of, of techne. I, was, I, I would love for you to elaborate on, um, if you can, uh, on, or if you thought, it, thought about it, uh, um, uh, on um, law as media. We've talked about law as techne, but I, I wonder if you could think about, if, if you want to have something to say about law as media. Um, that is to say, the, uh, the, the, uh, the icon as uh, not just an image, but as a, as a medium. Sorry. So, I'll talk about that first. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll just say, so, so the story is basically a story of modernity as a simulation of the spheres, law, and economy, and culture emerging is distinct, and culture doesn't appear until the economy kind of takes over something that was belong to the family or to, the, to a group that are not the state. Well, notion of culture. Yeah, politicized notion, yeah. I certainly kind of like, I, I can buy the story. I'm sure I would buy it because it's a very good story. Well, I have a book and <laughs> So, uh, very briefly, I, um, so I, I buy the story as half of the story and then the, the question of the other half, which is when, for instance, uh, religion is not translated or and, and decoded into uh, secular forms, but rather discovered as religion, hence lies beyond yes. the law and yes. receives uh, certain protection by the law as a religion, and that's the other side of this, and I'm sure we agree. And the, the embeddedness, I think that, that that's helpful and, and, and uh, goes along, I guess, uh, with what's been said. But then the question is, what happens to this category of embeddedness when it's not about a post-colonial situation? That is, what happens, again, in, with, with Jews in Germany? So that you could say that they're being, that they have their culture and it's being sort of uh, influenced way in, in a minute. So it is being uh, appropriated by Christian understandings, that's a possibility. But I'm not sure that that's what happens, because that takes agency from the, from the, the Jews. And the German Jews are German Jews, like the German Christians. And so it's much harder to say that this is something that happens to them from outside, outside of their embedded. This well, is, right, no, no, so, the, the, so the, the question is what happens, or I, I, I like the notion of embedded, but what happens when all this that we're talking about is what is embedded. That is, that that's exactly what happens. Well, and that's this is interesting. That right. it, it doesn't under the category of embeddedness. It's actually even more interesting, I think. 
I just want to kind of, uh, following uh, your answer, just kind of a question that Ed will present the paper is to what extent, I don't, I don't remember if it appears in the paper, but to what extent is the whole story, story of Protestantism versus Catholicism? Because the issue is kind of, I think, associated actually with a battle, kind of Jews are boxy for actually a, a battle which is not totally unrelated to Judaism, and it's an internal Christian uh, uh, battle between you know, rising Protestant state and Catholicism was seen as medieval and Jewish. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's part of the story. It's not. I can't tell the full story because it's beyond. The, but the but the Hebrews are mostly Protestants who criticize Judaism for being Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just add one one point? I think there's the two. I think there's a lot of important stuff in what, what you just said. And we could have a, a long conversation about it. Just two points, though. One is precisely the point you make about culture here, and this is really it is a very complicated issue because, of course, the term culture as a circulate a circulating possessed object exists within cultural fields in which culture itself becomes marked, very much like the law and uh, law and the law. Um, and the way that that happens, of course, is deeply complicated. Um, it, it, there are also situations in which culture as a political claim is quite different from culture as an inhabited field of, of significations. Um, and that congealing it, it itself leads to a kind of promiscuity analytically, especially among anthropologists who talk about those two modalities of culture as if they were the same thing or a historical progression, which they're not. They exist with one another in an embedded way, but in you know, historically and problematically embedded ways. And in part, of course, also by the deification of economy. The education economy, and the term market fundamentalism is one of those signifiers that actually tells more than it seems to tell. Um, and the, in fact, one of the reasons we wrote a book called Millennial Capitalism was precisely about the growing faith. Of, after all, that is what, neo, what neocon conservatism is about. It's about a faith in the, the salvific effects of capital to resolve everything. Capital, of course, deeply legalized which is interesting. And uh, the, the, the place where this becomes really interesting in relation to, to Shai's um, story is, of course, the rendering by the Pakistani courts of, of Islam's intellectual property, yes. where it's ever since 1994, now Islam is intellectual property. You can't simply build a mosque or, or, um, or goodness knows, alienate a, a, a symbol. Those things are wholly owned. And in fact, the, the, the judges in the case said that there, the, this form of alienation is a material harm to Muslims, uh, just as the god Shiva has, has in fact sued in court. Um, so these things become embroiled in, as it were, the sacralization of the economy, uh, which has its own effects on the relationship between culture as, as um, possessed and culture as a certain field of signifiers. So uh, can I, should I reply maybe a little bit? Ariana, would that be all right? Do I have the time? I'll just talk if that's okay. Um, I have kind of three thoughts. I'm not quite sure where you were um, taking it. Um, the first is that there's an amazing study of, of Latin, of course, within the sort of universal tradition of Western law, as it's so called. Uh, the medium was Latin. And there's a study of exams taken, or amongst other things, of exams taken by children in grammar and secondary schools throughout Europe in Latin at a time when the kids were doing between 20 and 40 hours of Latin a week, this kind of rote crunch. And um, the historian's conclusion, female historian, was that having looked at these exams about one in eight students had any working comprehension of Latin whatsoever. So the function of learning Latin was as a symbolic code and as a, a way of saying that we studied and belong to those who have studied Latin, but not that it could ever be used in any, any practical sense. So um, there's that remarkable power of these signs that mean nothing, these signs that hold a, a value that is not in any sense a literal value. And, and I think that fits quite nicely with kind of one of the ways in which we should think of lawyers and of the fictions that you're talking about, which was described in the, uh, in the Renaissance where they're very fond of legal fictions that, you know, the ship was in Barcelona to wit London, 
was a common sort of pleading. You'd have all these kind of devices, it's male to female and so on. There's a common one that's been repeated quite, quite recently. Um, so lawyers are euphanticists. Lawyers are fiction mongers. Lawyers uh, are able to generate um, a discourse that has only the most tangential of relationships to anything other than it itself, and that in a sense is, is how the medium develops, then there's a theological and there's a, a practical dimension because uh, an image is something that is defined by lawyers as uh, a mode of concealment. In other words, an image is a way of concealing, and a word is a way of concealing as well as of promulgating. And the third point is, is the lawyers did become very obsessed with the advent of print, uh, with the medium, and with the interconnection between iconomous and oikonomous, precisely because um, you can't promulgate law in Latin, you can't promulgate law in text. So um, there was, for 200 years, the most popular, one of the most popular forms of book was the legal emblem book. And that precisely has these images, amazing images. And you find a lot of texts. I mentioned Cook has a picture of Littleton and the seven orders of the Propositus' uh, lineage and so on. It has a picture of the, the law book itself on a cushion. It has a number of images and some of the continental books even more so with color and frontispieces. Hobbes's frontispieces yeah, are very uh, sort of significant one. There, there are plenty of others, but the emblem books in, in particular are the legal hieroglyphs in a sense. This is the response to Harapolo and the Enigmata and kind of the, the fact that law is a sacred knowledge which you're now presenting in the vernacular. So how, how do you do both? You know, how do you um, allow that paradox? And, and the emblem book is one of the most fascinating examples because it, it has all these tears. The emblem book is an image that everyone can draw from, and it's a jurisprudential normative image. Uh, and at the same time, it will generally have a Latin motto, which is obviously incomprehensible, and then it will have a vernacular verse which will explain at an intermediate level, because literacy is, is not that widespread, uh, as between, and these are books that would be read, and these are books that can be seen, and, um, and then it dies. That's the acclamatory and the angelological, and that's yeah. precisely, I mean, the, the, the definition of um, honor is uh, celebritas. Yeah. And you'll find that in all of the early law books. And then celebrity has its colors. So People Magazine, you know, you, you yeah. see everyone in, in their clothes. And in yeah. these books, it'll tell you who can have which, you know, the red and the purple of uh, the higher echelons of the nobility and so on. And, then you can choose your images, but you can't take other people's images, and so on. So it is, it is precisely a coding of celebrity. Marianne. Um, I have a couple of questions about the relation between history and law, and uh, either spectacle or spectre, the way that it came up in several of the papers. So at the end of yours, Peter, where you talk about how you've done a history that of something that never was right, or something you talk about it as an unwritten history. Very struck by that. And I'm wondering, in that history, two things. What's the relation between the image and the theatricality? And what's the relation of that history to the history that Roger was describing? Are you in line with that? Or is it a different kind of history than the one Roger describes as somehow ennobling through noble lives and whatever else it takes, the activity of life. And then for Roger, I was just wondering, uh, and it was very quick what you talked about, I don't think it was in the paper, about the revenge point that you made, about how revenge um, gives us justice and justice, or somehow, and justice exceeds law. What's that that exceeds law in this world? 
And then is that excess the same as what Shai was talking about in his response to John as what it is that these anthropological and historical accounts can give us access to? And is that, I, I didn't quite get in a soft paper, um, but I'm sure this is my, no, no, it's one for each. And then they can choose if they want to give it up. And then in a, a soft paper, the, at the end where you say, oh, so now we have to do rhetoric, otherwise we're in danger of uh, something that sounds like you're associating the specter with the causal account of culture. What does that have to do with your beginning example of that magician's case, right? Because what isn't being spoken there seems to me very different than what anyone else is not speaking of. And I'm just wondering if any or all of you want to address those. And I honestly this not at all as a criticism, just because I'm just trying to figure out, is there a way that I can put this panel together in a different way than the wonderful way in which um, Tom Conrad. Exactly. So. What's this? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, no. I'll say. I'll say something. Yeah. Um, I think that. Uh, I think that when when John says that you know to make visible the senselessness of law, and when Shai says, "Do I need this?" Yeah. When when Shai says uh, that I need to that I said that law is always culture or history is human made, um, I, I don't think I was saying that. Um, and maybe Marianne's question allows me to say sort of why. So um, when when um, someone take, takes revenge, okay, um, Monte Cristo, just to take an example, many of us will know. Um, he makes the claim to be the mountain of Christ. He makes the claim to be holy. He makes the claim that his judgment is divine. Um, and he makes it explicitly. And he makes it not as a lawyer. He makes it, as he says over and over again in the text, as an artist, as someone who, and, and that raises the, the question of what an artist is. Um, Shai suggested, and I think rightly so, because I mean, Nietzsche at times goes on both sides of this. I may mean, have to maybe clearer where Nietzsche is and where I am. But there is at least a Heideggerian reading of the Nietzsche on art, where the artist is simply a rapturous conduit for um, a holy, the realm of the holy. Uh, it, the, the argument that I'm trying to argue, make in the book about the excess of justice, the excessiveness of justice, that justice is always an extraordinary act, and not one that can be done through law, but has to be done by someone acting personally and individually, um, is that the avenger, the person who takes revenge, makes a claim to be doing that which cannot be rationalized, that which cannot be um, rationalized in a court of law or by you know procedures, etc. They just make a claim to do justice, at which point um, it is up to the uh, viewers, the spectators, to decide whether the claim was uh, right or not, right? They can either accept the avenger as just, or they can say that the avenger was an, did an act of injustice. Um, uh, and the best place for that to happen, which is where the argument goes, is through a, a jury trial where the question of jury nullification comes up. But, um, you know, as Harren says in discussing the Schwarzbard case of 1927, when he kills this Laura, the, the headman of the of the pogroms, and then gives himself up and puts him on himself on trial, is that is how one does justice by first killing yourself and then putting yourself on trial and letting people say that what you did is, is is just or not. And so I don't think that's I don't think that's man making justice. I think what that is is us recognizing that if justice is going to appear in the world, it's going to appear in an extraordinary act in which we do justice, and then that justice can either be recognized and affirmed or not by others. Um, in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that it's only in art that religion can happen, um, not in science or not in a discourse. Uh, you know, 
It's only in standing and letting oneself be and making a claim to be a conduit for a higher, a non-discursive form of justice that we can actually have the possibility of religion in the world. Um, and also for justice. And that's the claim that, that I'm, I'm making. Um, so that, and, 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 and the lying aspect is the con, yes, we make a holy lie. We lie that we do justice. We lie that we're God. But we know that's a lie. And yet the lie has to be beautiful enough. The act of justice, the revenge, has to be beautiful enough to be believed. And that's what keeps justice alive in the world. That's, that's the claim that I'm trying to make. Um, okay. Okay, uh, just yeah. my specific goal has to do with <laughs> With the quotation, the text is don't really like to quote it, kind of refers to 19th century, you know, old antiquated 19th century notions of culture. So, kind of, you know, I didn't have time to present everything kind of in, in there. So, it's just, a, just an attempt to create some sort of dialogue with people doing tax history. And I know it now in ways that don't take into account a more complex notion of culture. So the image and theatre, just very quickly, the Roman Digest, as you know, bans theatre for 200 years. What's it banning? It's banning foreign, Greek, histrionic um, imitations or com competitions with law. Um, so theatre in legal terms, theatrum justitia, is the discourse of jurisdiction. It's, it's the discourse, in other words, of getting onto the stage. And the image is surely the theatrical mask, the medium through which one can get onto that stage. Um, and that is sort of to, to be a person in law. Actually, in law French, is to be a parson, which I love. It's to be a priest, because you, you represent things parochial. And, to become a person and to, to have a space within the jurisdiction, you, you need to have that mask and you need to have that acclamation. Well, the, the, the image is the, the medium and the role through which one can participate in jurisdiction, through which one can act in you know, precise sense that for Cicero, again, and I need to tell you, is, is uh, the lawyer's actores. Do we have other questions, comments? There was one here, yeah. <laughs> so we all. Exhausted everybody. Well, I think we should thank our panel for it.